Well, hello and welcome to Life of Legends. This is Justin Bell. This week, it's the case of JB meeting JB, as in this JB, meeting Jensen Button, the Formula One world champion version of myself. So our paths have obviously occasionally crossed, mainly at social events like the Goodwood Festival of Speed or even back in the day at the bar at the BRDC Dinner and Dance. I've always thought Jensen Button and I would be great friends. He just never knew it. So now we live in Los Angeles, I've definitely been hoping for a while that we could sit down and tape an episode. The trouble is, Jensen is busier now than ever. But last week, before the madness of racing kicks off, we met at the Peterson Museum and had a really good time. Whether you're an active racing driver working your way through your career, or however you approach your racing, you tend not to get that involved or, or aware of other people's racing backgrounds. They're just there and they're doing their thing. You're too focused on yourself. And for me, that was the case with Jensen. But once I read up on his early days in karting and how incredibly successful he was, it all kind of dropped into place on how and why he set himself up for such an amazing F1 career. In karting, he won literally everything against some of the biggest names in racing. Three times British Open Kart champion, winner of the European Super A Championship, and many, many more. His very smooth and precise driving style led to a long stint in Formula One, where he won 15 races and, of course, the Drivers' Championship in 2009. While his post-Formula One career has been pretty far-reaching, his appetite to race is still huge, and so there's some very exciting news just ahead. Stay tuned. Can't break it on this show. But thanks to everyone at the Peterson for giving us the space to record this episode. And obviously a highlight for sure was seeing a couple of his old Formula One cars in the vault. Very cool. We had a great time. Two hours flew by. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. I retired from F1 when I was 36. I look back now, it's so young. Isn't that young? Yeah. It is now. Then it was like so old. Oh, old, old bastard. <laughs> get him out of here. Yeah, get him out of it, exactly. But now, <laughs> my missus is like, you should have done two more years. It's like... Two mate, more years and we could have had another house. I know, exactly. <laughs> but it's it's not like that when you're in it. You just, you just want to get out at that point. Yeah, 17 sure. years. All the bullshit. And you're driving a shit car. And it, isn't that the end of it, though, when you start driving a shit car? I know, yeah. yeah. But it was for a great team. That was yeah, the thing. It was McLaren. So. How did that? Yeah, I mean, just think about it. You, you got you're driving for McLaren, who on principle you think would, well, it's as good as you get. Right? Yeah, you just happened to pick the, the wrong moment. I know. Well, I was with them for seven years. Yeah, we had no, some you good were. years. You did have some good years. We won. We won a few races. Did you find out? It was funny. I, I mean, I'm totally. It's totally not the same. But it's on a. I imagine on a just a higher scale. Like when I did um, at the end of my career, I was doing sports cars. And I was just, in, in sports cars, you end up racing, you know, the final nail in your coffin is when you race for a rich guy. Oh, right? really? That's, you know, <laughs> That's so you've gone through factories, <laughs> you've gone through, you know, as with Dodge and then everyone, yeah. and Corvette, and then you suddenly race for a rich guy. <laughs> and you go home on a week on a, that night and you go, it's little, I'm a little like a whore, yeah. I decided. And it's I'm, all down to him, right? It's down to him. How quick he is. If you get in the top three, yeah. drop down to 20th. Exactly. Back in the top three, he crashes, you get so a it's check. All about the amp. It's all about how good the am is. Yeah, in the, it the really races. is. Yeah. And some of those guys now are fucking sweet. You They're know, good, Some aren't they? really good drivers. Is it Ben Keating? Ben Keating is probably quick, the best. Yeah. yeah, I think think with, with Ben, he when he came on the scene, because I was involved quite involved with the Viper world, they... Um, Everyone was like, oh, this guy's doing like amateur racing, yeah. but he's smoking fast. Mm. I was like, well, how fast can he be? Yeah. You know? And then you, I saw him on track and was up against him and started going, Christ, if this guy had started young, I know. he would have been... But how can he still be a bronze if he's that quick? That's what I don't get. I don't know how he holds that. Yeah. Because he's, he's won old? championships. He's yeah. won... I think he just keeps getting older and gets demoted. <laughs> what are you in sports cars? What I you can't, glow, I you know can't never do. be lower than a platinum, which is even you if never, I'm 80. Because you won a championship. Yeah, which is kind of annoying. It's, a, it's <laughs> funny, I, I I mean, it's annoying, but good. But yeah. I mean, never in the history of a sportsman have you wanted oh, yeah. to be downgraded, downgraded for anything yeah. in your whole life, right? Like Martin Brundle got to 60 and went, I think he ended up being a silver. Oh, did he? Yeah, he's a silver now. Still hasn't helped him, but... Um, yeah. But he, he's it's a funny old system. My, my friend Chris Buncombe, who won yeah, Le Mans, yeah. 
um, in LMP2. He's he's a bronze now. Is he really? <laughs> he's forty five and he's a bronze. Yeah. It's good if you if you happen to fall in the the category at the right time. Yeah, it means you get a job. Oh yeah. If you it's happen to money. not, you're fucked. Oh totally. Like um, I watched the Fassbender <laughs> yeah. uh, documentary. Yeah. Which is quite interesting because it just shows you how much goes into driving because he's so open with his emotion and everything and it just shows you what we try and hide as a racing driver. Yeah, I haven't seen it. It's really Crazy. good. Okay, yeah, I need um, to. And uh, one of his drivers, um, I should bloody remember his name, one of the, uh, we're, we're great with four Yeah, we're really, the guy. <laughs> yeah, that guy, yeah. that guy yeah. is really good. Um, anyway, so he's with him all the way through the project for, for yeah, yeah. No, sorry, not that guy. The second guy, the, the silver, the silver that's in the cars with him for four years. For and then anyone the, listening, this exactly. is good entertainment. Yeah, and then watch he, the documentary. And then he gets to um, just before Le Mans, they go, "Well, actually, now you're a gold." So he loses his drive, mm. and he doesn't get a drive no. for Le Mans because he's just a gold, and yeah. they're going to take someone that's been there for years. Yeah, you had, that happened a lot when it first came in. There were people at one Daytona, won the championship, who didn't have a ride the next year. Yeah. But there is something weird with the AMs. They keep well because they pay, so I'm sure there's got to be something in that. Yeah, and 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 next year at Le Mans, it's you got pro cars, which yeah. are the LMDH, LMH. Um, basically, LMP2 is going to be pro am, yeah. and and then pro am for for GTE yeah. as well. So they need they need people to be bringing money. Yeah, they really do, and it's a lot of money. It's not it's like oh, a couple of grand, hundred yeah. grand. No, they are bringing. Yeah, and. Off. Well, I guess the factories pay the pro, don't they? A lot. Yeah. Like Porsche. Yeah. Yeah. Are you doing it, Le Mans? You don't uh, know Possibly. Yet? Really? Possibly, which is actually really exciting. Um, but just talking about how much it costs, I've got a GT3 team. We've run yeah. GT3 cars, GT4 mm. cars in the British Championship. And it's abstractly expensive. And, you know, people have to bring millions to race in the British Championship yeah. in GTs. So there's a lot of teams that aren't going to be able to, you know, continue. I, when I like IMSA's this year is going to be so exciting you know Daytona I mean all the cars the, the teams that actually I'm just going to close this door this is the lady from the Peterson um, they uh, it's going to be brilliant we're going hopefully we're doing the pre-show I think so um, you know because yeah. there's so many stories so many good things it's I remember sort of was it eight years ago seven eight years ago at Le Mans and it was just nuts because you had uh, you had Tota Porsche and Audi and everyone was like oh my god it's the best yeah. time ever at Le Mans it's better yeah. than Formula 1 yeah, right yeah. now and that was a great time but now you're going to have eight ten manufacturers with wow. two cars three cars each and Ferrari which is yeah. good it's I know good, good. Why is it we always get excited? I mean, I do about seeing a Ferrari. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's I I do. I, do when you're at the Formula One races, do you particularly like? I mean, you obviously have your alignment with McLaren and I mean a few teams yes. but from the past. But do you still get excited to see the cars? Yeah, I do, and, and I I work with Williams still. Williams, okay. Um, so I do quite a bit of stuff for them as an ambassador, um, and obviously they're not where they where they want to be, but it's still amazing to see the car that's you know finishing 10th in the constructors you look at the detail on that car yeah it's unbelievable you know there's no other racing series like it no, you know i've raced in different things around the world in super gt which is really exciting in japan yeah. great cars super yeah. fast but you look at the detail yeah and it's nothing like still a like one car. Rust, he's still primitive isn't it oh, it's so yeah. primitive and, and there's not a scratch on a formula one car yeah. you know if, if it gets to paint chip they just swap the chassis out and, uh, and and you have different front wings and different wings. Obviously, yeah. it's it's changing a little bit with the cost cap, but I do love that about Formula One, yeah. the high, the high detail. And you know, the, you go to a Formula One factory and you can eat off the floor. Wouldn't yeah. recommend it, but no, you can eat off the floor. It's so clean. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's another world. And I think most F1 drivers, when they they, they love racing in F1, and then they they're like, oh, you know what, I, I want to try something different. They go and race elsewhere, yeah. retire from F1, like Fernando yeah. Alonso. Yeah. They go and have their fun. And then they realise, yeah, they realise that uh, actually Formula One is still yeah. the pinnacle. I mean, he was—he's a good example, isn't it, Alonso? Because was it four years ago when he did Daytona with Wayne Taylor Racing? And you could there's that moment. I don't know what it was like for you when you were doing the Super GT. Because I know the Japanese fans—it's still pretty intense. But they come to IMSA, 
and you know when they walk in uh, whether it's Vissakello when he first came in they come from Formula 1 you know you guys come in and it's like your guards up because you're used to one billion people needing you and then you're in the pit lane and you go well I guess I could talk to people because there are fans <laughs> and they're rabid fans but yeah. it's a different you have to detune a bit don't you to well, come into sports cars in, in F1 it's quite limited at how many sort of fans really can get into the paddock especially yeah. when I was racing they've opened it up a little bit yeah. more in the paddock so you know I do a lot of TV stuff and work with Williams so I'm in the paddock quite a bit and uh, it's, it's a lot busier when I was racing to get in the paddock you had to be involved in the sport basically mm. uh, but then you go and race a Super GT and it's a free for all is it really? You, know, yeah, you yeah. can't walk anywhere. Yeah. And the Japanese fans are real, real racing yeah. fans. They know their stuff. And they'll do anything to yeah. touch you or yeah. to, to yeah. get an autograph or a picture. So that was definitely, uh, it was quite extreme. And yeah. uh, two years for me was, was enough there. Loved the fans, but I felt a little bit claustrophobic. I, I thought, because I've never asked another driver this, there were moments when I did uh, JTCC, right, with HKS, so that's 2019 or something um, what car was that in it was that with Anthony Reid and I was, I was no I was 96 I think but with Anthony Reid and, and Vauxhall we were racing Vauxhall and it was my only did one year which wasn't enough because every time you get to a new track you yeah. know and it was pre-sim days so you talk to young drivers now that's a whole other <laughs> thing you can talk about but they're like what you used to walk the track what the fuck do you do that for you know um, but I swear during the autograph sessions the girls were so excited to get your autograph, but their boyfriend was even more excited, right? You're going, are you kind of giving, someone said they were giving you their girl. They wanted you to sign them anywhere, and the yeah. girls were excited, but the guys were excited. I remember thinking, maybe this is cultural, yeah. you know? But they get too excited that they don't actually get anything signed, or don't get a picture. They no. just get too excited, and they walk away, and it's like, Oh shit! <laughs> you can see them go. Oh, yeah. Did you get and it? Did you get the security guys are pushing them on, and they're like, ah. "So no, it's uh, it's extreme, but it's amazing that they're so passionate about their, their yeah. motor racing." It was funny. We'll come back to all this, I guess, in a minute. But you're busy as busy as ever now. I mean, uh, it's like when you were racing, it was very singular. Yes. Right. It's like workout, race, test. Now, I mean, Radford. Yeah. Formula One, TV. You're right. You know when you're when you're properly in it as a driver in Formula One, everything is is focused on you mm -hmm. and driving. It's a very selfish way of living, really. Yeah. You know, you you leave the circuit, you go home, might go for a few beers that evening, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you recover, and then you're back into the training. You're back into the training, eating yeah. the right stuff, um, focusing on the next race, doing sim work. There's nothing outside of Formula One, really. That's 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 sort of sort of freedom away from it you're always yeah. aiming on being a better individual in the sport as a driver mm. mentally physically and then you step away from it it's like oh this is nice this is yeah. great and then yeah. you spend six months like oh this is amazing freedom and then you're like oh well, what am i going to do with myself now <laughs> yeah. and what what you know i really need something to sink my teeth into i spent my whole life aiming for something yeah, and yeah. fighting for race wins in formula one and then suddenly you got nothing really to focus on and that was difficult i must say and um what I, did you what did you do with that time well i did i did um i did some racing because i raced in japan for two years yeah so that was straight you went straight into yeah that. i remember years. thinking when i read that that must have been just that sort of the opportunity is too good to do and you were so used to racing but it probably your friends might have been like I yeah. thought you said you were having time off. I know, and well, it's, it's only ten races, but then yeah. you know you travel there for testing yeah, yeah. And, and sim stuff. But um, it was also I loved Japan and, and I loved the cars. You know, I tested yeah. a Super GT car while I was in F1 and just thought it was mega. Yeah, it was a lot more difficult than I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No tire warmers, heavy car, uh, and these guys, you know, the Japanese drivers know the circuit so yeah, well. They do. Yeah. I'd driven Fuji and Suzuka, and then you get these little circuits, like a British circuit, yeah. really. Type twisty, it's the no run off area. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah, exactly. and you're driving a car around, and it's as quick as an LMP1 car. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Um, so it was definitely a shock to the system, and you realise how much talent there is there. But I, I really loved the challenge. We won the championship in our first year. Most of it down to my teammate, not me, yeah, yeah. uh, Naoki Yamamoto-san. Um, but um, I, I enjoyed it. But then again, it was like this is this is too much. So then, yeah. you know 
sort of retired after two years from, from racing and that. I did Le Mans once in the yeah, uh, one I think I saw LMP1 you last car yeah, yeah. in 2018, which which I loved. I loved the experience. Yeah. You know, we were never going to win. You're up against mm. Toyota, a works yeah. team, but the car was insanely Fast. quick. Yeah, that that era I was doing the pit lane, so it was the cool coolest thing to you know have raced there so many times and won there and then you know been there with my dad since I was a kid. So Le Mans like my my baseline in racing like every experience i can almost chart my life right been there so it's very exciting when i saw people like you come in or Lance or whoever comes and does it um but always that omnipresent thing with toyota for the last 10 years i mean i was in the pit lane when and i used to race for arika in the yeah. Shonet, you know so they you know they do all the logistics for toyota and i'm standing there and the 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 TV guy goes, you know, go down. You you you're covering the Toyota end. Go and get near to Shonak for the winning moment. And then the car stopped. Do you remember that? Like <laughs> yeah. one lap to go. Yeah. The other side. And I've never. I mean, I've never seen the, the abject. Yeah. Car. Were you filming him or not? Well, my camera's like looking across at him, and I just go. And they're like, get in there. I'm like, I'm not getting in there. No. That's my problem. Yeah. Is that you've I'm not a that real side. journalist. Yeah, so, yeah. so I go, oh, I can't fucking do it. Well, you've it been that. on that side yeah. of it. You know what it feels like. No, I'm like, I'm he, doing he wants it. to punch you. Yeah, I want to, he wants to punch yeah. someone, and yeah. I'm not going to be him. Yeah. But the, the head of whoever was the head of Toyota, the, the top, top man, yeah. was standing there, you can imagine, surrounded by all his, his legion of peep executives. Because it was the proud moment, mm. right? They're going to plant the yeah. rising sun on, on the moon, effectively. Yeah. And he just turned walk back and they didn't look didn't and his people were just didn't know what to do and i remember going and they're going follow him i'm fucking following him <laughs> i will never never yeah. walk in a pit lane I, again it's it's uh, a bloody tough race it is, isn't it? there's nothing like i mean you've got daytona yeah. but for no, some reason something. yeah i mean you've got to think the car is it open with throttle for i don't know how much of the lap Imagine what it was like when they were in the 917 yeah. i mean full throttle for yeah. a minute and a half there's that video i don't know if you've ever seen it in car 956 is yeah. a video dad had a camera in the car going to the big mostly world championship races in the Rothmans but the camera was this big yeah, yeah. but it's brilliant it's a brilliant video if you ever yeah. see it but they you hear them on the Mulsanne straight and I, I played it once for a talk I gave just like a minute and a half at full throttle yeah you know, so. what, and, you, and you look at what they were sat in as well doing 243 miles an hour yeah. The steering was doing this on the straight. I know, I know. <laughs> and there's nothing in front of the driver's feet. No. It's hidden by a front wing, but it's, yeah. the it's just front there. feet is the front of the car. And they're doing 243 miles an hour. That's it. Did you, when you did Le Mans, because all the Formula One and Spa and Monaco and all these tracks that everyone in the world would want to be at. Yeah. But pulling out of the pit lane at Le Mans, it's, it's pretty it's, freaking It's cool. weird because when you actually look at the circuit as a whole, You've got the chicanes on the straights, and you think, well, they're just an afterthought. Yeah. And it's kind of weird, and they're yeah. like all the same, really. Yeah. Just the other way around, and some of the some of the circuit when you're actually there, and you, you take away it's Le Mans, the 24 hours Le Mans, they're not that exciting. Yeah. But when you look at the thing as a whole, yeah, it's a yeah. massively long track. It's got everything you can imagine: undulation, the Porsche curves, fast flowing, yeah. dangerous. That's fast. The last the last two chicanes on the on the track, you know, they you're seem like, a bit like. Why are we? Bit, it's like they almost put them in on a street I, circuit. I know. You know, I know. Go, yeah, it's a little strange, but then. It, it tests the car in every way possible. Yeah, yeah. The high speed tests the aero, the braking, the big curbs really test yeah. the car. And when I drove the LMP1 car that I was, I was racing, which is actually a Dallara base, it's terrible on curbs. So you'd yeah. basically miss all the curbs. Yeah. So you couldn't use most of the circuit that oh, all the shit. guys were using. Because in the chicanes, that's a shitload of time. Yeah, you know, and then the corner exits, you couldn't use yeah. the curbs. Oh, okay. And LMP2's could, but yeah. we couldn't. Yeah. But the high-speed corners were just phenomenal yeah. in that thing. But that car was, was a great car, and it was actually quicker than the Porsche that raced the Le Mans LMP1 yeah. and, the, uh, and the Audi. Wow. Because it was a few years on from yeah, that, yeah, but we yeah. just still couldn't challenge the Toyotas. But great experience. But the whole idea about doing Le Mans in tw 2018 was to get the experience, to go and do it with the manufacturer okay. in the years coming. But yeah. it just, so much other stuff happened uh, uh, well, in the world, not just in my life. But then I obviously, we had a son as well yeah. in 2019. Yeah. Our wedding got delayed. And, you know, personal stuff, everything got delayed. So, um, yeah, so it, my racing sort of took a back step. 
And you know, I'm, as you said, I'm really busy with different things. I'm, I'm loving the challenge of Radford. I've got a car yeah. company. I know. It's just nuts. Um, a coach building company. So it's, it's been really tough. Um, you know, with, with different things as it always is with every startup. Yeah. Especially trying to bring a supercar into the world when suddenly there's a million new supercars out there. And some with the EV and yeah. some, you know, yeah. it's difficult. It is difficult, but there's been a lot of love for the car because it is such a mechanical car. Yeah. You know, yeah. the way we've designed it, it looks like I an old Gordon Murray goes car. and pulls the car I know, out. Same You're like, size. the best guy in the world. <laughs> well, the T33 is kind yeah. of the same size as our Radford. Yeah. It's got a V12 in it instead of a V6. But then it is three times the price. It is, so, yeah, I know. Um, and, uh, How did the Radford thing happen? How, where did that come from? It it came? Suddenly, boom, you're posting about Radford. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was uh, Ann Anstead, yeah. um, one other guy who w was starting Radford, working with a, a manufacturer, yeah. and they said, do you want to come on board? And initially, I was like, you know what? I'm way too busy. I've got so many other things going on. And I got home, told the missus about it, and she's like, well, you, you got to think about something long term yeah so yeah. why don't you go and see what he's got to say i said and he, he gives it all this on the yeah, end yeah, you know he's, yeah. he's a big talker um so I, I went and spent some time with him and it and it sounded like a really exciting idea yeah. and you know um and and jumped on board we we got talking talking to, to lotus about giving us chassis and what have you yeah. uh and then everything else was down to us to develop it into yeah. something unique and um, we're still developing it right yeah, now yeah. Um, the, the first cars are going out in, in a few weeks, but the prototype is, is basically there now, which yeah. is so exciting. Yeah. You know, it's a thousand kilos, 600 horsepower, manual gearbox, the Where biggest, making them? biggest brakes you've ever seen. Uh, they get finished in Newport. Oh, do they? Here? Yeah, in Newport. Oh, shit. So we're still wondering if we're in a British car company or an American car yeah. company. But, uh, it depends what's most advantageous. Exactly, exactly. Time. But it's been a really fun process, you know, being a test dummy is a little scary. Yeah. You know, you know, you live in the Formula One world where everything is is it's as safe as it can be. You know, racing in a Formula One car is the yeah. safest form of motorsport there is. Totally. Yeah. And in a controlled environment, then you're suddenly doing testing with a car that's never been driven by anyone. Yeah. And uh, you know, you do all the aero work on it, but still you don't know if it's gonna take off at speed. No. You know, 160 miles yeah, an hour. Yeah, yeah. Go, is it gonna just take <laughs> off yeah. if I hit a bump? But um no, so we, you know, you have all the sensors and everything, yeah. but um, still a little bit scary. Yeah. And I haven't told my missus that. No, you don't. It's the first no. time. Hopefully, she isn't going to listen no, to this. Probably won't. Uh, but uh, it's been great, and I've I've enjoyed it, and the customers are really happy. The first yeah. couple of customers understand also that they're involved with In the process. The process. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. there'll be new parts coming all the time, um, and uh, yeah, we're actually going to be doing a race with the car. I can't say what yet, yeah. but uh, wow. to to promote it. So very exciting. Are you? Um I was thinking, someone wrote something the other day, I don't know if it was another driver, about Nico Rosberg and said, Nico left Formula One so he didn't, he could spend more time with his family, but he's in the pit lane every single race. You know what I mean? It was just back to what we were saying, right? Yeah. It, straight back in. Um, Formula One is just, it just, it's the moment, right? It's yeah. like the uh, drive to survive, the epicenter of everything, three races in America next yeah. year, that's wild. Um, five million dollar packages at the win in Vegas or whatever I mean it's just nuts yeah it's and nuts. I mean to be fair the, the circuit isn't going to be great for racing no. but the atmosphere and the event it's going to be a good one yeah. yeah I know it's like a home race I can drive yeah. there I know I'm so. actually driving to Vegas this afternoon okay. um, they've got uh, CES is the consumer electronic shows this week okay. it's the biggest trade show in the world cool and they have um I'm just doing something for Motor Trend there with BlackBerry, but it's it's kind of it's kind of cool. Uh, I've never been, but you know, it's like Samsung would have floating TV. You yeah, know, they have whatever you you can think of uh, is there. But of course, now it's a car show because in EV a way, because EVs are yeah. not cars. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's what I'm doing this Innovator Award thing, and I've been watching all these documentaries, and you talk to these people, the like the engineers behind it, and it's we we're, we're from manual give yeah, you know yeah, yeah. learning to i know top, yeah. you know heel and toe back in the day and everything and then these cars you can go to sleep you know on your app give yourself another second of performance if you want to buy more power on the app or more range or i mean the future in that is 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 extraordinary i don't know if it resonates in my heart no i i have to say you know, being a petrohead, I I've driven some electric cars over the years, and they definitely have their place. You know, I've yeah. got an extreme E team, and I think it's yeah, fantastic what they're doing. 
Um, oh, just to add to the things you do with the kids, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, which which is great. And and you know, seeing them go to different places around the world that are affected by climate change, I think they're bringing a lot of awareness um, and pushing technology, which is great. But I struggle when I'm driving an electric car, yeah. a racing car anyway, yeah, yeah. because I don't get the feel, I don't get the revs, I can't hear when it's wheel spinning, I, I don't yeah. have the connection. And I, there's something I need, maybe some drivers can work with that. But the yeah. way that I drive, I need to feel everything through the yeah. pedals, yeah. More, more so than the steering wheel. Um, but as a road car, it's difficult because they're really good. They're mm -hmm. really, really just easy to drive yeah. an electric car. If you have the infrastructure in <laughs> your yeah. country, which I know most countries don't, here yeah. in the States, we do have yeah, yeah. Um, you know for me to be it's it's perfect and I, I jumped in one the other day and I was like it's it's not gonna handle very well it's so heavy yeah um, but because it's a skateboard and the weights at the bottom it's as low as you can get yeah. the weight it handled really well yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and I didn't want to like it but I did like it yeah, and there's a lot yeah. of people out there that have never driven an electric car and they're like oh electric cars it's not gonna be fun I'm never gonna own one but when you actually drive them they are good I yeah. just hope that they have the right people the, all these all these new manufacturers that are building cars they have the right engineers that aren't yeah. just um, engineers that understand EV they actually understand what a car should feel like yeah that's the important thing because that's how you're gonna get us yeah interested in and EVs. I think there will be there will be the outliers that create cars for people that like to drive but 90% of people don't care about driving it's just a yeah it's a functional tour right and they go yeah. from A to B and in a city like LA I can totally yeah. understand but uh, Tommy my uh, business you know my partner in the talk show Tommy Kendall he he interviewed someone the other day super knowledgeable and smart if every ha car in LA was an EV we need 1,000 times more power mm. generated into the grid that's not gonna happen right no. so so we're gonna have a balance there's gonna be a balance but um, this is why Tesla's not probably making money out of cars it's, probably not making, it's cars. making money out of solar and solar and I um, I got asked once a couple of years ago and it was ignorant but it was my version of it like oh so what do you think about you know watching cars race you know I've just been to the Formula E race in my first one and and uh, you know you're there and they're playing all the pop music and then they go <laughs> and you're all they're like you can hear the diffs and you can hear the tire yeah, yeah. you can always hear the driver's teeth chattering you know and I was like they said so what do you think of it and I went have you ever watched it's like watching porn with the sound off right <laughs> it's like you're, you're there go it's all happening but it's not it's not connecting with me and I think that will be but we're judging it by Old, old metrics maybe go, go yeah. and stand at the Porsche Cars at Le Mans yeah. and then you and, feel it and then you feel it because you actually feel it you, you feel it through yeah. your body don't you yeah, the vibrations yeah, yeah. for the engines yeah, and you do it was um, so I called Jill de Perrin someone on the way here and as I say he's probably my best mate and um, what best mate one of my best mates and uh, Jill's very funny because when he was racing and I he was last week's interview I, I was hosted in. his show last week um, the first one of the year and we sit outside and we drink and we eat and is you know he he always had a really good balance as a driver um totally obsessed obsessive obsessive at race weekends but on the monday just had a really good time it was like you know elio come around and tony canana and i lived in lauderdale so it was really fun it showed me the brazilian sort of spark yeah. for life right focus but knows how to have a good time and Anyway, but when he was driving, he had no, nothing good to say about anyone. You know, who was it? It was part of his mechanism. Was was you know, which, you know I'm, I'm better than everybody. You had to have that, right? Yeah. But when he retired, he was suddenly this whole different person. You can be a bit more magnanimous, can't yeah. you, about the opposition and things. But when he ran, I remember him saying when we were drunk one night, he was talking about you. Uh, while he was working with you, and he just said he's fucking smooth and this and that. I was like, oh, it's interesting for Jill to say it. it was really yeah. complimentary so I called him this morning on the way here in the rain to go so what were you talking you know just remind me and and my interview these podcasts aren't really about oh you did this in that race and that but he was like he Jensen was just like you look at his trace and you go and it would be his qualifying lap and you go is that his out is that his out lap or was he behind because you were so supremely smooth and your he said your connection to grip was almost the best he had ever mm. seen. Um, to bring it up, because you talk about EVs, you don't feel that. 
where did was that just you and carts who did you did, i mean because we all gain our senses yeah. from everything right but it was a, it was actually a supreme talent of yours it was a talent in some ways and then it, it definitely was a hindrance in others um i think when by that you mean if not being I, able to get heat in the tires at certain yeah, times yeah and, okay. that was an issue and also if a car was oversteery it was past the point of comfort for me and i struggled mm. with that yeah i was empty um yeah so i needed a car that was stable that i had a strong rear end um did you le- generally tend to a little you could a little push almost yeah I could and, and to be fair Oversteer on Exits was fine it was yeah. braking I needed the confidence on braking so okay. as soon as I had a bit of rear movement and, and also if we had a tyre that had the construction moved so okay. like turn three in Barcelona fast right hander it's flat easy in an F1 yeah. car now but we had a little lift um, and it would take a set the tyre so you would turn in and then the steering wheel would do that and it would take a set on the tyre and I hated that movement yeah because it felt like oversteer, but it wasn't yeah. really oversteer. It was just the yeah. tire taking a set, or the suspension taking a set, and that for me also was an issue. So heavier cars are always a bit of an issue for me. Yeah. Lighter cars are better. Yeah. Um, but um, that that hurt me in that regard. But then also, if I fine tune a car to, to how I want it, I I confident enough that I could beat anyone. But the problem yeah. is that doesn't happen enough in motorsport. No. You don't find a car that's perfect for you. Yeah. So that was that really hurt me. Um, but in the wet, it, it worked well. Yeah, yeah. In, you know, in the changing conditions, yeah. because I could really feel what's happening rather than seeing what's happening. Yeah. Because sometimes you think, oh, it's wet, I need to go slower. But I could feel it more through my my feet and my bum. Yeah. And it was always uh, um, through my feet rather than through my hands. So you look at a trace comparison because I raced with some of the best in the world Fernando Alonso um, Jacques Villeneuve obviously was a world champion I raced with him um, and Lewis Hamilton for three years and you see the trace with Lewis and he comes into a corner he hammers the brake just hits it as hard as he can doesn't think about modulation Um, and then he does everything through the steering wheel from turn into exit so he's busy he's busy on the steering wheel but his brake no throttle no he well this is when we were teammates but he'd hammer the brake get on the throttle and it would be, always be the same the, the, the way that he went onto the throttle he'd never modulate it he'd do everything through the steering wheel really? yeah so just bang bang and then everything through the so steering really wheel controlling it so really no fucking it. use to you to try and copy at no, all no so it's completely opposite <laughs> yeah. so I would come and modulate the brake yeah. have minimal steering angle yeah. and then apply the throttle when I thought it was right, right. so it really helped me in certain ways and then other ways it hurt yeah. me you know um, would you carry the brake into the corner more than someone like him yes your style? which it, yeah. and, and a, a bit like daniel ricciardo you know he yeah. everything he's raced in formula one he's been amazing until he got to mclaren and the problem with mclaren is you can't do that yeah. you can't you can't trail brake into a corner mm-hmm. while steering yeah because you, you just lock up the front where you're used to balancing it all the way in yeah, yeah yeah so for daniel that was an issue and for me it was a kind of bit of an issue at mclaren but yeah. i could i could deal with it but for him i think it's too extreme so. yeah interesting no i mean and of course formula one cars as a spectator just look so you try and watch the driver and you can tell when someone's busy right because they look otherwise it's just like it's like watching someone in you go oh they're hardly moving the wheel yeah so for the average fan it's difficult to you're understand like, you're like, how people is that are hard? like oh how, yeah. how's that hard and yeah you're like yeah. i move my hands more on my simulator at home yeah. you know and you go no you have no yeah. idea well to be like, fair when i you know people say oh he's, he's smooth but then i watch footage of me qualifying sort of 15 years ago 10 yeah. years ago and it's not that smooth compared yeah. to now but because the back then you could it could be twitchy and you could drive yeah. it a bit twitchy and you could catch the oversteer yeah, yeah, and exits. Yeah. Whereas now you never see oversteer with the cars, and yeah. it is because there's so much weight. If it does go, it's gone. It's gone. Really. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. You, you saw that a lot when they went to the bigger cars. Yeah, but you go through a high speed corner and then suddenly the ridge is gone. Yeah, and a lot of the drivers that raced at Red Bull alongside Max really felt that, and you saw that. Yeah, you know, massive talent, but they just didn't have confidence in the car that it was going to s- stick, yeah. and it didn't. Um, so they've just changed a lot of the cars and the drivers that have learnt to adapt are doing better than the others. They are big now, aren't they? Really? I big. saw like a graphic of like the car from, you know, the mid 2000s to now. Yeah. It's like, it's like they've melted to yeah. the ground. They're well, we used, to, we used to look at IndyCar and go, oh my God, they're, they're massive. They're so big, the cars, yeah. like a yeah. truck. Yeah. But the F1 cars are bigger than Indy cars now. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Did you, um, did you enjoy the technical side of Formula One were you good in the debriefs did you 
because you've got to, it's it's intense that way right it is finally yeah. you put the helmet and you're like fuck I can go but yeah the and rest of it there's two different things I mean you can you come in after your run and it's about explaining what happened on that run mm. you know having you, you know you're driving the car and trying to get as much out of it as possible um, at 220 miles an hour yeah yeah uh, but you also need to be thinking what's happening and not just what's happening at that moment in time for the whole run yeah. you know I understand the tyres are going away on this lap so the next lap's going to be worse so you've got to be a bit more gentle on that corner exit but then you've got to be consistent run to run because if you're doing comparisons and yeah. back to backs so it is tricky as a racing driver you just want to go flat out yeah. as quick as you can it was quite interesting we used to do wet testing and they used to water the track because yeah. it hadn't rained that's and weird <laughs> hold on just oh we're yeah. back oh uh, so I guess the money's out the exactly meter. It just puts it another 10 cents in um, but so they'd water the track and it would dry in certain places quicker yeah. than others yeah. and you should be staying on the wet bit but as racing drivers you just went for the dry bit because you wanted the quickest lap time yeah. that day yeah. completely screwing your race prep for the next race yeah. um, but um, so no there was a lot that went into understanding what the car's doing and then feeding it to the engineer and it's easy for us to go well it's it's crap isn't it it's just yeah. not working on that corner yeah, and you I hear I hear some interviews and, and um, of drivers or not interviews of drivers talking to their engineers and say it just doesn't work there's so much overstep but they never give details no. it amazes me that still it was still people aren't giving the details do they you think be. some of that is from so what was your, what was your first year in when 2000. you 2000 I was first year in F1 first year in F1 but so before that we still had to come in right before I know Formula 1 was so ahead of sports cars and everything else but your engineer would sit there with his little clipboard and no, no no say, so what do you think? Yeah. And you'd be like, all right, you yeah. know, what's going to be best for me? Yeah. <laughs> you know, or what's best for the yeah. car? I think your ability, if you come from the 80s and 90s, in you know, you had to literally tell yeah. what was going on. Because they didn't on. have any data. They didn't have they any other data. Very simple data, you know, wasn't it? Yeah. Very. And I remember, well, I remember like at Le Mans in the Vipers, this was mid, late 90s, I had this, uh, you know, fucking lock up at the end because no ABS yeah. no traction control and nearly 800 horsepower in that bike and coming I, I spun it in, in our nage like half spin off you know when you kind of recover it and, yeah, go, yeah. and they're like so is everything okay back Marcus <laughs> you know what I mean because yeah, yeah, exactly. there was no other way of telling yeah. you know there's a, shit that was, a, that was you know and you try something and then you could literally go no I got, I got behind someone you yeah. know you could, why did you lose that a second that bird ran across yeah, the road you know, or you something you could just make something up but now the yeah. amount of data that they're receiving is almost more than yeah more than you can cope with oh right? totally but you, you still you still need to give the correct feedback and there needs to be that understanding between a driver and engineer yeah. you know it's uh, people think this is hilarious but no F1 engineer has ever driven a Formula 1 car no. No, that's true. so they don't know how it feels no. so sometimes even though you hear like Lewis or anyone go no um, your data says one thing but I'm yeah. staying out yeah, exactly or I'm coming in yeah so it's doing this with the car and they're like well it doesn't look like in the data what, it feels like you it should in the fucking car. sit where I am and if, right? it, if it feels like that my mind my brain is making me do something that I don't want it to do yeah. so we need to fix that issue even yeah. if you say it's not doing it it yeah. feels like it's doing it yeah um, so no there's a lot of information and you, and you need that that language between an engineer and a driver but it's not just about giving them in the info you need to be part of the process of, of improving the car yeah, as well yeah, yeah, yeah. like I have oversteer here and you can't just say that yeah, you need yeah. to be involved with what you think is better but that comes with experience in the yeah. sport uh, now the now the guys do have simulators like they're driving every day oh, in the simulator Simulators, which I hated but it was part of the process and yeah. we did it sort of once before every race and they must be better now I mean so much the simulators, simulators yeah I mean I've got I've got my simulator at home and um, you know I'm going to be doing some racing this year yeah, yeah. and I'm driving the simulator at the tracks I'm going to be testing and it's it's not a proper simulator but yeah, still yeah. you're getting the feeling of where the tracks going the tracks that I don't know yeah, yeah. Uh, and it definitely helps and then the team actually have the data that they can give you for your simulator to go drive. Oh, yeah. So you can do it at home. Yeah. Not Amazing. in your pajamas and get yeah. out of there. Did, what was it like when you... And I also, when Alonso came back after the sports car like hiatus, how was he able to get back in a car? Is, is it because, A, he's one of the best we've ever seen. Two, the amount of... Uh, embedded information I mean the technology in those cars you can't just jump in one can you it takes a lot of 
you know to be good How, I mean is it just because he's so good he got a great car and he's back uh, because you did it yeah right? I mean, what was that one race like for you oh that was nuts for me I mean because you've been out yeah I hadn't, I hadn't raced at all actually no. that year yeah that was sorry I took a year out of racing you're right yeah. so 2016 I retired from F1 and 2017 I didn't race anything and yeah. apart from Monaco and F1 car I did one race in Super GT in, in August of that year uh, but um I, I remember getting the call. I was at home here in Brentwood yeah, yeah, yeah. with the missus and uh, with our new little dog, you know, starting yeah, family life yeah, already. Yeah. And I got a call from Eric Boulier, who was running the team at that time, McLaren, and said, Jensen, we need you to race in Monaco because Fernando Alonso is going to race the Indy 500 in IndyCar. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the car wasn't great, the F1 car, and that's why he was able to, allowed to do that. Yeah. And I remember saying to the missus, like, I don't want to. I don't want to go and race in Monaco. It's first of all, it's brand new, te brand new um, uh, cars this year. Completely yeah. new technology. They're much bigger, much yeah, wider. Yeah. Um, I've never done anything like it. And, wh and you, what? Your first time you drive it's going to be in Monaco. Well, you've got no runoff area no. at all. And she's like, "Well, just give it a go." And I yeah. called my manager and I said, "Do I have to do this?" And he said, "Contractually, yeah, because you're under contract as a certain wow. driver." So uh, I went to the simulator and drove the simulator for a few laps, and I rolled twice into the into the uh, into the into the port <laughs> like this is going well uh, but at least i knew the steering wheel because yeah. they hadn't really changed and the, where everything was and the cook and because yeah, yeah. i was part of the process of designing uh, that okay because i've been with the team for so many years um but when i jumped in the car for the first few laps it you know you, you're just warming up to it but then after five laps it mm. just feels natural really it's scary how natural it feels yeah. i remember coming in going this is awesome this is so much because it is the ultimate right yeah they grip where your gt yeah, yeah. car never would grip yeah no they totally grip, they great like no le mans car would but it had more downforce than i was used to so going to a circuit like monaco and having to brake later than i ever had in every corner yeah, yeah. that is really difficult mentally because i didn't get the chance to drive it at silverstone where there's loads of runoff brake late yeah, so you yeah. can feel what it does and yeah. what it, and how it reacts to braking that late so that took me a bit of time so i could get to sort of two or three tenths off my teammate and then the last bit was more difficult yeah. but I got him in qualifying yeah, which yeah, I was no, quite I excited about it was um, also the world's press are ready to go he shouldn't be doing it right yeah. I mean there's a side of that when the media I mean any other form of racing IndyCar they do get it but you're a global audience yeah right? and I mean, it's Monaco <laughs> and it's Monaco so you're percentage chance of fucking up is quite, yeah. is quite high yeah but the, the British press you know I, I knew them for all their faults I, I knew them very well and uh, and we got on very well yeah, so yeah. it was it was fine I think they were just excited about having another Brit back on the grid yeah no I'm sure so um, no it actually went it went really well the, I mean the race wasn't great um, I put someone on their roof but it was frustration <laughs> yeah. more than anything else okay. you know because I qualified ninth. yeah teammate qualified 10th or 11th and um, should have been in the fresh in the you know a, ch a chance for points and then I had an engine penalty so I had to start yeah. last so. did you um did it make you after, did you have another chat with your manager like, well, if another one of these comes no, up, I'll do it. No, definitely that was not. It. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, some, some drivers, some F1 drivers are F1 drivers. Yeah. Daniel Ricciardo, I don't think he'll race in anything else. Lewis Hamilton, he's yeah. just an F1 driver. Yeah, yeah. I'd say just, yeah. probably the best driver ever, but uh, he doesn't want to race in something else. Whereas I do, I want to race in everything. Yeah. You yeah. know, I've had chats with people over the years to race in, in Le Mans, race in IMSA, race yeah. in NASCAR, race in Japan, yeah. race all over the place, race in Rallycross, race in Extreme E. So I've, I've wanted to race in many different categories. Some of them haven't really worked out just because of timing. But um, as I said, I'm, I'm really excited to be, to be racing again this year in okay. 2023 because it's the one thing in my life that I miss. Um, my missus is basically like you, you need to go and drive something you're Get driving me nuts yeah. 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 you know I did my first go-kart race last year for 25 years yeah and I'm actually racing this weekend are you? in a kart race yeah uh, Adams oh, no which shit. is like the oldest kart track in America and yeah. it's like this big yeah. Um, so yeah racing against 16 year old kids yeah. wow <laughs> I, I, I was it's funny because I miss I never did karting I was racing motocross oh because my dad was driving and yeah. so I didn't I didn't I just didn't do it. Um, I didn't get in the car until I was 18. But when I was just, yesterday I was looking at your Wikipedia page, because as you can tell, I don't really have much format for this. I just was like, because I was so focused on my own racing, suddenly I'm going, oh, Jens Button's going to three, who, who is he? Oh, he's going to three Formula 3000, and then you're in Formula 1. But your karting career was, 
as good as it could have been really right? yeah I mean you couldn't have won much more I missed out on the world championship the, the only thing when I was racing the European championship was eight races so okay. it was a championship the world championship was one race ah. so if something went wrong it's game over yeah 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 um, so we kind of thought the European was was the bigger deal and obviously I won that so I'm gonna yeah, say that yeah, yeah. but I was running in second in the world championship and uh, the engine ceased because back then they were so highly strung, 21,000 yeah. revs. Jesus Christ. Yeah, Christ. and nuts, isn't it? So the whole yeah, time yeah. you're like, you're just yeah. waiting for it to go back. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I loved that time of my life. Did you really? Traveling around the world. And with your dad. Yeah, A exactly. It, right? And you had, you had 30 drivers within two tenths in qualifying. And it was so close. And I keep watching the videos of my karting career more than yeah. my F1 career. It's yeah. quite funny. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably because I've, I've got back into it at 42 years old. But uh, it keeps you sharp, and yeah. it's you know it's the it's close to home. It's the easiest way to go racing, and uh, and I'm absolutely loving it. Your um, another thing that Gilles said about it, he said you could tell he'd been extraordinary in karts because you could all through your career you were really good, and kart drivers are uh, put in the, your car without causing any chaos around you, just in the right place. Yeah, right, and in Formula One that's desperately important right and yes. with the overtaking rules and stuff that awareness i don't think can come from anything else no. it's it's in karting it's a rhythm because if you make a move in karting and it doesn't quite come off you lose eight places yeah because it goes bah, and you yeah. just everyone just flies <laughs> past you <laughs> yeah so you have to be precise you have to make it happen yeah uh and you want to make it cleanly and the same if someone's overtaking you you kind of you don't want to fight them too hard for it because again you slow down you lose yeah. four places so it's a great way to learn and all the I'd say most of the great F1 drivers they have are, come right. from karting yeah. you know Lewis's background in karting was was the same my dad actually used to tune Lewis's go-kart engines yeah. Yeah, yeah is it no surprise to you that he's achieved what he's achieved no definitely I think he's he's come on a lot since we were teammates as well yeah. he's definitely a much more rounded character um, I mean you need to be in the best car to achieve what he's achieved yeah, like Michael yeah, Schumacher yeah, yeah. you know um, you've got to beat your teammate but uh, which he's done most of his career but um, you need to be in the best car the years that really stand out for me are the years where he's had to go up against someone else in yeah, another yeah, another yeah, team yeah, yeah. those are the ones that mean so much more they really yeah. are because you're up against another manufacturer uh, and two drivers normally yeah. so those are the special years um, you know Seb Vettel People say, well, kind of four years at Red Bull, didn't do anything after that. Yeah. He got close. But it was the Red Bull time that was so exciting because they yeah. were up against big teams. They're up against yeah. Ferrari, they're up against us at McLaren. Yeah. 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 You know, if Lewis and myself didn't take wins off of each other, we probably would have won championships those years. Yeah. Um, but he, he had it tough. It wasn't an easy way to the, to, to the championships for, for Seb Vettel. It was seeing him in the end, you could see how much love there was for him and such admiration. And it was the right time to step down, wasn't it? Because, yeah, you know, you could see flashes. It's not his fault. Again, you know, sh yeah. Do you, do you think I'd change the question that any of those Alonso or Vettel in Lewis's car now would do very well with their skills, right? Yes. Because once you're at that level, yeah, everyone's capable of winning. Yes. Really, the top guys. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But it's but always the thing with motorsport, isn't it? You it know. Is, yeah. yeah. Michael Schumacher, greatest. Lewis Hampton, possibly the greatest. But he is created it, to, it. Yeah, is it down to him? Is it down to the team? It's, it's a team sport. You know, yeah. you win and you lose together. Yeah. Um, and for him to want to continue racing and fighting for wins, yeah. Because it's not money, is it? Not money no, at this point. It doesn't, doesn't need any more money. But I must say, for me, the most impressive year for Lewis was actually last year. Yeah. I mean, he got... He, he, I don't want to say trounced by his teammate the first few races, but he, yeah. he didn't... Do as well as I thought he was going yeah, to against yeah. George, but to come back from that and to be as competitive as he has been and his his attitude, really impressive. Yeah, and George is really quick, isn't he? He is, and yeah. that's tough as a team as the number one, isn't it? Really, when you have someone come in that's young and they're young and they're just like, yeah. I mean, Lewis isn't old, but shit, there's a generation gap between yeah. the two of them. And Lewis and, and George is he's clever. You know, he's playing the team game. 
you know yeah. um, even if he qualifies really well and he you know he's, he's sort of third and Lewis is sixth for, for example he'll go yeah it was it was it was all right you know we I want to be fighting at the front though and fighting for pole position and you know I feel for Lewis he had a problem you know he's always like that it's not like yeah, yeah I kicked yeah. his ass yeah 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 um, uh, but I know deep down inside, it, it, for him, this is mega. For him yeah, to yeah. beat Lewis in any it's race, in, in any qualifying session, is massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's right there, isn't yeah. he? I um, no, it's very impressive to watch. I think it'll be a uh, very exciting. Also, to see the way Max handles, you know, the way he handles himself, his maturing, and then you go, how many races have they done? How yeah. old are they? I know. Like, how old is Max? And I know. how many races? It's wild. Unbelievable how many races he's done. Yeah. Um, but. Um, yeah, I, I'm hearing his comments the other day about I don't know why Lewis and myself crash so much. I, I didn't hear because they never they never want to give a they an never want to give an inch. No, right? and they're too similar. Yeah, in a way, right? In that way, but then they race against other people and it works. Yeah, how is that? Don't you remember that? I mean, you do remember, like, but it's like in touring cars or whatever. Somehow you have a magnet to another <laughs> guy, and you go, I don't know why we're the only two that hit each other yeah yeah normally for some reason if i was really pally with a guy before the race i would always crash into him in the yes yeah. <laughs> i was like so i ended up just not speaking to anyone yeah. before a yeah. Grand Prix. very strange yeah, you, it, was, it was like a magnet yeah. but um but no for me you know f1 is is spectacular and it, it's great being part of a team that's trying to develop and get back to the to the front fighting where yeah, they yeah. feel they should be um, but for, for from the racing point of view everything else is is more exciting for me at the moment yeah, yeah, yeah. you know if I got the off an offer to race in F1 I and I, I wouldn't get an offer but if I did <laughs> I, or, or, a, or a top for team for anyone listening yeah. who's not at all interested <laughs> or in a it. top team at Le Mans in WEC I'd go for WEC would you? Yeah, because yeah. it's something I haven't I haven't achieved in, yeah. and I just love the idea of different types of cars yeah. and prototypes and GT cars yeah. and the sounds of all the different engines and and you know I think people said I've spoken to a few people about next year and about racing at Le Mans, yeah. and I'm kind of I kind of like I want to race at Le Mans. It's going to yeah. be very special, but I also want to watch it. Yeah, no, I, I'm going. Ten to different manufacturers in 2024. Anniversary. It's yeah. going to be oh, this year. Yeah, yeah. This year, sorry, yeah. Yeah, but, but even next year with with even more of the manufacturers racing in. Do you know it sold out them all Has this it? year for general admission, first time yeah. in history it sold out. Really? Yeah, it's going to. I mean, we were there two years ago. Dad was grand marshal, and it was a big deal as a family to be there, and all the you know it was the first one after lockdown, so there was yeah. a lot of people. It was really. It was really fun to go to, and, and I mean, as I said, I've spent so much time there, but to to not be doing TV and not raise, it was I, it was a really fun. No, I bet it was moment. a piss up. <laughs> it was basically it. Yeah. It's basically it. It but was really. I really wish it wasn't a week, though. I know it's so long. I remember doing the uh, the scrutineering on the Sunday, and then it's like, what? We, the yeah. race is Saturday. Mm. Uh, it's a bit too long. Yeah. I wish they shortened it by a couple of yeah, days. Yeah. Uh, but at least now I think you've got the official test. The weekend before. No. I think it's the Monday is now. Is it the Monday? Oh, wow. Yeah, which is good. So you've got scrutinizing on the yeah, Saturday yeah. and then the test on the Monday. Because it was two weeks before. Mm. Um, so you're kind of a bit busier because yeah. there's a lot hanging around. Yeah. Uh, but so I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. When, when does this go out? Probably next week. Okay. Why? you got news. <laughs> no, I have. I yeah. can't say. Yeah, no. Um... You didn't hear it here first. Um, I uh, I remember. So obviously our lives were because I'm ten years older than you. You know I was a different phase of my life. But I remember all that career, all your karting, all all the you know three thousand everything. And then I think I was trying to think this morning it was the BRDC dinner and dance. And you hadn't gone to Formula One yet, but we're at the bar, and your dad was there. But effectively, you you didn't have anything. It was yeah. like you your career, your Formula One thing hadn't, or maybe done one year, and it was like. But I can't remember if it was ninety nine or two thousand. But it was like you were at the bar, like getting pissed, going, oh, "Fuck!" I mean, I don't know what I'm doing. Almost, it was your career. There was was it ninety eight? Would that have been? 98? Well, end of ninety nine. Um, I was in F3 in 99. F3. And then in that year, I, I didn't know what I was doing. That's, that's what I mean. Yeah. So I think you're at the bar going, yeah. you know, everyone's getting their awards and everything. And I remember yeah. everyone was like, that kid Jensen, he should really be something. Yeah. But that fine line between, oh, it's you could have not, you wouldn't be living in Brentwood, so, you wouldn't, you know what I mean? So many drivers have not made it that, that 
probably should have. Should have, yeah. Um, because they didn't have the funding. The wrong place, wrong time. Yeah. Uh, and I, yeah, it was the end of my F3 year, and uh, I did two tests. I yeah. tested for... That was the BLEC goal, the drive. Didn't you get the drive to uh, test? The McLaren Young Drive McLaren Award, yes. Drive so I, but before that, I drove um, two Formula 3000 cars. Absolutely hated them. Did you? Uh, just the massive lump sequential gearbox yeah, yeah. and skinny little me in the car it just yeah. felt so weird yeah. and didn't like it at all especially for my f3 such yeah. a flowing nice car yeah. uh, and then i i did the young driver test in the mclaren um at 19. i uh, loved it and then after that i got a cool uh, call up to drive the prost yeah from and he was a alan. hero of yours wasn't alan was yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, well he still is uh, yeah. but uh i was in Me um, mexico at the time on holiday with my girlfriend yeah and uh, they said we want you to test the car in barcelona like two days i'm like sorry love yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we jumped on a plane through flew straight to barcelona and met, met my dad there and uh, and tested the car which went which went really well yeah uh, did 33 laps and then the engine seized at turn three Ooh. uh yeah but it was it went well and that's how frank um, heard about the test of Frank Williams and uh, and and then called me over Christmas when I was in the pub with my mates drinking beer. Yeah, I'm sure you were. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We and I remember we call and uh, it was hello, Jensen. This is Frank. Frank Williams. Like, yeah, of course it is. Of course it is, mate. Who is this? Come yeah. on, I'm looking around. And uh, and it actually was. So yeah, that's uh, that's how it all started. The vine tree and fruit. Vine tree and fruit. Sticky carpets. It's. Uh, there's always a place that you remember when you get good news. I was in the Starbucks on Laurel, just as you go over Laurel Canyon to Ventura, when I get a call from an unknown number and I was really wanting to make my move into like real TV. And it's like, hey, Justin, it's Jay Leno here. I was like, yeah, basically the same thing. Well, just fuck off. Yeah, exactly. like, it can't be Jay Leno. I'm like, but an unknown number. That's Maybe a really good accent. Yeah. So you do sound very like him. Anyway, that was it. Um, we're quite similar in build. Physically, did you, when was the moment you I better get really strong and fit to yeah. be able to hold? Yeah, I mean, most of my career I had power steering. Okay. Um, apart from Benetton 2001, and that was a horrific year. Okay. Um, that's where Flavio said I was a playboy. And I was about to bring that up. When I was, when I was driving in Monaco, uh, it looked like I was looking for a new apartment or a new boat. <laughs> and when I got in the car, because there was no power steering, yeah. my hands were bleeding. Wow. Trying to hold on for the race. Like, oh, thanks, Flavio. That's really nice from a... You know, team owner to say that about their own yeah. driver. So. I was also thinking when I read that comment, isn't that a bit like Hugh Hefner accusing you of liking boobs? I know. Right? You're yeah. like, you are yeah. the biggest playboy <laughs> exactly. in the history of mankind. I know. Well, at least he knew what a playboy least, was, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So he, maybe he was right. But no, I, I, I had no, a horrible word, but no, I, I, I enjoyed life out of the car and probably wasn't serious enough at that point. So he kind of probably was right. Yeah. But that wasn't the reason for that bad result. I no. finished seventh. I mean, it wasn't that bad. No, it wasn't Just that bad. outside no, the no. points. Um, but um, no, I definitely had ups and downs in my career. But I really did have to work on my fitness. In mm. F3, I was so unfit. Yeah. Um, and I remember doing a fitness test. And the guy said, you have determination. I mean, he could <laughs> yeah. see me on the bike doing the yeah, test. Yeah. But he said, you're really unfit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then I went to town on fitness. You know, that's yeah, something yeah. that I pushed really hard. And I yeah. felt that my whole F1 career, I was the fittest drug. Yeah. Do you? Yes, well and I always worked on making sure I was fit to every year I raced. Yeah. Uh, and it was through triathlons. Um, I, you know, I also had to remember I was six foot tall. I was one eight three centimeters, so I had to be light. So I couldn't eat carbs. So after training, it was really difficult. So yeah. um, I was sixty eight kilos at my lightest in F one. Yeah, and then at my fattest, seventy one kilos. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now I'm 75, 76, yeah. and I lift weights now, and yeah, I no, feel I so much better for it. You know, um, and when you're in your 40s, you kind of need to start yeah, lifting I weights. Need, yeah, yeah. I'm, I did it, and then I trailed off, and now I'm like, my girlfriend's, you know, she's very fit and very fit and fit, and <laughs> and so we're so you know working out together. And that it's like, helps. It helps, and it's fun. Yeah. You know, she's very yeah. knowledgeable and. And I, because if I never had to do cardio in my life again, I would be happy. Really? I, I mean, I just, I like hiking. Yeah. I can't run anymore, just so my knees just oh, don't no. enjoy it. I don't, I've just got into cycling, but not on the road. I got a peloton. It's too dangerous. Yeah, here. Yeah. Totally. Mountain biking. Mountain good fun here. I, I actually would like to do that. I've never tried yeah, it. Yeah, a few of my friends are into really? it now, which is good. Well, they all have, they do it and they have the little motors as well. Well, they do, yeah, which. To help them. Well, you still pedal, though. Still pedal. No, yeah, I know. You it's just not go a, for it, though. Go for it, that's what yeah. they say. No, I, I, 
it's like my dad's always been in incredible shape yeah. but I never remember him like being mad about working out he just never stopped yeah he was also from that generation tickled. I don't know if you've seen my dad's hands they're like dad's hands are the lot I mean he's a farmer yeah by trade he, I mean, he used to be able to hit my sister and I, like both of us in one swipe, you know, in the back of the car. <laughs> uh, but he was from that era, Joachim Mass, Dad, yeah. they were they were jacks. Oh yeah, they had to be, to hold on. They have to hold on. Yeah. yeah. And the feedback through the steering wheel, especially with the size of the tires, the front tires that they had. So no, fitness was a big thing and I'm, I'm loving it at the moment because I have freedom to do what I want. But yeah. now I'd limit myself to an hour a day because yeah. kids and other stuff so much other shit going yeah. on but, and I'm enjoying it so I'm boxing a lot are you? my wife boxes kickboxes I'm well, not she doesn't fight but she uh, the she'd kick the your pants. ass yeah, yeah she would actually she does the old yeah. spin kicks Fishing. and everything so boxing I do another training session they call training mate which is really good it's like an, a 45 minute session yeah. and, uh, and I do weightlifting do um, and then running for base training yeah. so you know the thing with weights as well though is it's like you do look, I remember seeing Mark Webber, like they sh- he had, like, had his shirt off something and you go, it's bizarrely thin, yeah. skinny when oh, you're yeah. racing Formula One. Yeah. They're fighting their natural body build, yeah. aren't it they? It looks wrong. And then mass- this massive neck. And, and then these skin- skinny little, skin. yeah. yeah. And they all bulk up after they, yeah, yeah. or bulk. I mean, exactly, it's either belly or it's arms, yeah. But I think most drive, it's like a, a way of life. Um, so the Playboy thing was something I, it was a weird phrase because I think, as you said, we didn't. Have, we just said when we started, we didn't have social media, so we could all be a bit naughtier and travel around and everything. Um, the trouble is, you were in the public eye much more than I mean, like me. Yeah. No one really cared, but still in the sport, it's that balance, right? If you're winning yeah. and you're doing well, you, you're you like sh- you can fuck off. Yes, yeah. I want to celebrate. What, what I, I do just tonight achieved. is yeah. my but, yeah. but there's a there's a weird line isn't it yeah, the, there is. then suddenly people go he's not serious yeah and normally it's people that have no fun that accuse you of that exactly and exactly and also the picture that, that somebody probably got it's it's in your worst state right yeah so a photo always looks worse than yeah, the reality i know so um so yeah i mean when I, I i've seen pictures of myself when i've fallen out of a nightclub in london yeah, this is yeah. 20 years ago yeah uh and i'm like oh my god that's embarrassing yeah. you know when you look at the actual photo but yeah. then i remember oh i had a great time, back. A good time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's definitely a place for it you know i think when you when you celebrate a victory like you're right they can piss off because yeah. i am celebrating what i've just achieved it might be my last f1 victory yeah yeah no. um, i'm gonna celebrate that with the people that made this happen and uh you, you need to there needs to be a balance though you know well, yeah. i'm very serious when it comes to racing and yeah. even now you know when i go and race something i'm unbelievably serious you know i don't yeah. have a drink the night before no, and, and what have I mean. you i'm very serious when it comes to racing now and fitness and what have you I'm, as i said i'm karting the weekend and i'm training for it yeah yeah <laughs> so funny. um but you need to relax after and there needs to be a yeah. balance of fun otherwise you burn out too quickly do you think the modern guys have can find that balance yeah I, I think they do they just do a lot more restricted because they have to said, hide away it's, it's, it's a bit like it's a bit like that picture of them all going for dinner to celebrate yeah, yeah, battle yeah. Do you and see? they've got water yeah, on the yeah, table yeah. you made a comment I think about didn't you make no, some I, kind I of didn't no, it, someone's like well how can they have a hundred and forty thousand dollar you know yeah. meal tab or something yeah. right between twenty of them? And there's no alcohol. There's no alcohol. You know yeah. they're like, okay, fucking put the water on the table. Yeah. And I definitely would have been the one that thought, no, I'm going to put my beer on the table. Yeah, exactly. But they hundred percent had. That somebody must have had a beer they've put on the floor. Yeah, because there's no way that at the end of the season you're not going to go for yeah. it. Yeah, and, and no one's time. even drinking sparkling water. I mean, come on, guys, <laughs> or fruit juice or anything. <laughs> it was such a fake. <laughs> but you know, when the doors close, everyone's like, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's, well, yeah, yeah, and it's a shame that it has to be like that. Yeah. You know, it's so limited. But to be fair, they're either playing on the sim or, or I'm sure having a good time. It's great to see um, George post a picture of himself and Fernando. Yeah, um, in New Year's Eve. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally would never have posted a picture of myself no. partying. No. It's just something I wouldn't have done. But no. it was nice to see that he's feels free he feels and open enough, enough to to, yeah. to post the picture. And it's it's cool to see drivers spending time together yeah. as well. I felt that when I was racing, I didn't really see many drivers. It's very different than the IndyCar world, you know, where they all they all know each other, they all hang out. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe because there's that risk element more in IndyCar, so yeah. they're more of a family. Yeah. Whereas in F1, you do your own thing. You, yeah. You're with your own team. Planes disappear in different yeah, directions. Yeah, exactly. It is like that. And 
you know I, I made a point of it and a few other drivers when I was racing that we would all get together at certain times okay and like fun. you go to Suzuka yeah you'd all make sure you got yeah out, I mean, there was one time I think it was 2013 we all flew from Korea from the race to Japan for the yeah. race and it was back-to-back -back weekends and that Sunday night we went to a, a shop bar called Geronimo's in Tokyo I did go to Geronimo's yeah, yeah. and basically there's, there's plaques on the wall for how many shots you've done that evening and I think the pie is like 80 shots and that person must be dead, dead now they're dead, yeah. but um, you go in there and to order drinks for everyone in the bar you hit a drum and there's I mean there must have been 11 drivers F1 drivers that were, were there it was it was it was a good night yeah. uh, and then everyone's getting a little bit more tipsy and I end up like my round I can't find the the stick to hit the drum yeah. with so I punch the drum and then one of the drivers I like, JB hit it again he holds the drum and oh I you didn't know. go through it no no I didn't go through it but I hit it and it, I went over on that knuckle which is still yeah. broken oh it's not broken anymore but it's down Shit. and I broke my hand yeah, and I remember going, oh <laughs> shit. I was so drunk, but still I felt the pain. Yeah, yeah. And DC was there. I could mention his name I was <coughs> because he wasn't say, driving. I was about uh, to say, as long as you had DC around to act as the... No, but even DC looked at me and he went, oh, oh JB son. I was like, just, yeah. He went, come over here. And he got me some ice, put ice oh, on it. Shit. And, uh, and I, I headed home. And I remember being sick in the toilet while my, with a broken hand <laughs> holding it up in the air I went to see work with them and I'm like I have to go to the hospital and I went to yeah. the hospital and they said you're going to have to put it in a cast for two weeks at least I'm like I'm driving a Formula 1 car in four days <laughs> yeah so I, I basically say can you strap it up and just give me some really strong yeah. painkillers uh, with it, you know, this, this yeah, knuckle was yeah. completely broken and, uh, and I went and raced that weekend it. but I, I told the doctors which is probably a mistake the F1 doctors so every time they saw me they said you can only drive the car if you come and shake my hand before you get in the car it's like what Whoa. how can this be a test for whether I'm, I'm worthy to drive an F1 car if I'm safe to drive so uh, they shake my hand unbelievable pain yeah. drive the car and have to peel my hand off the steering when yeah, I came in so. and uh, I remember the team that was McLaren they, they, my teammate was um, Checo that okay, year yeah. and they wanted to test Kevin Magnussen for 2014, the following yeah, year. Yeah. So they're like, Jamie, you sit out this race and we're gonna put Kevin in and they want to do it back to back. Well, I'm not giving up my seat. Yeah, yeah. So I went through all the pain and actually drove the race and I think I finished eighth in the end. But it was one of those weekends where, um, you know, I was trying not to shake people's hands and I got away with it until Nico Hulkenberg walked up to me and shook my hand. Oh, and it, yeah, the old Just, German handshake. Yeah, yeah, jeez. Uh, and it killed. But yeah, that was, that was the one time that I thought, what an idiot I am. Mm. And I remember my dad saying to me, he's like, JB, you're an idiot. I'm gonna do my life. You do your life, thing. Right. That was the first time I remember him being really like angry at me. Was he? Yeah, and it was, it was, it was sad to see, but you know what, it happens. It? We do silly things. And the root, the history of drivers is littered with some pretty stupid things. Oh yeah. Because just the dynamics, people. That's why I feel sorry for the younger guys a bit in the in the public thing. I mean, I'm sure they just have to go somewhere and say, "Everyone, leave your phones if we're going to yeah. have a good time." But like my dad's era, they go to Kailami, South Africa. I mean, he call home once a week. Yeah. You know, just and my mama yell at him about something we, you know one we didn't call home because you know there was no communication yeah right now we're being facetime i mean i was in a best thing i ever saw at a racetrack was this guy guy his finger over the camera going babe i don't know who's in the bar and he's got his finger over the camera going i don't know i haven't got a good connection either i love you you know and i'm going yeah. <laughs> it's awful she's not saying yeah, she's exactly. not she, you know i mean there's two ways of looking at it. one it's very positive because you know yeah. we travel away from kids I get That's to face down my kids and I get to face down my missus, which is great. Um, but the other side is, yeah, everyone's got a camera. Um, but, um, and it's just a shame because you can't pick your nose in public. You uh -huh. can't do anything anymore no. as, as a driver. But there are lots of upsides still to being an yeah, F1 driver. A, do, you, do you like the fact in LA no one really knows who Love it. anyone is, right? I, I mean, I, literally you go anywhere, no one. I no. mean, there'll be the uh, there will yeah. be someone, right? Yeah. Grocery stores. Yeah. Is, is where you get noticed, which is weird. funny? Maybe there's less, uh, you're I moving slower. Is. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, I, you know, especially the last couple of years, because Formula One has had a bit of a boom in the States, yeah. um, I'll be sat in a restaurant somewhere, you know, I'll, I'll 
go and train and they get some food somewhere yeah. and I'll be sat down there'll be two people sat next to me and they'll be talking about Formula 1 yeah, I, I just find it hilarious you know, yeah, know. as an ex F1 world champion the only race I, I raced sort of four or five years ago in F1 five six years ago actually but they have no idea who I am no. and I'm just eavesdropping on their yeah, conversation yeah. about Formula 1 and who they th thinks the best and yeah. who's going to win the next race uh, it's just it's, it's great that Formula 1 has got bigger here and I, yeah. but I'm happy that I'm happy that when I was racing, it wasn't so big in the States. Because I, yeah. I can. I can walk I around just as but normal. But to be honest, Lewis Hamilton does. Anyone yeah. that, they love coming to LA or yeah. New York. Because really, most of the time, they're not. Most there. of the time, most yeah. Of, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, he has transcended it, hasn't he? He's yeah. now, I mean, he goes to the Oscars. He goes here. He's, yeah, I mean, he's, so he's not helping himself. He's not he helping himself. He can't go. And the people he hangs <laughs> yeah. out with, you know. Yeah. He's quite extraordinary. Um, back to your dad. I remember it. Can I go for a pee first? Yeah, you can go this for a pee, absolutely. It's a good idea. Yeah. Oh, he's One, two, three. Yeah, he's unbelievable. Oh, that's been all week. We have to make the most of uh, of of all the uh, the rain. Actually, it's like my daughter I loves. Know. She loves the rain. She just like she doesn't like the continuous sunshine thing that we have here, but she loves the rain. So, really? Yeah, it's really. Bizarre. I love it when it happens like for a week. Like yeah, this. that's it. Um, then I am. I realize I like this. I like sunshine. I do like waking up in the morning, like if you're training, if you're yeah. doing anything, it just makes you want to... Well, and here it's it's fresh in the morning still, yeah, isn't it? I know. You know, it's like the UK, but yeah. with a nice, with a nice it's like a nice day in the UK. Yeah, I know. Uh, so your dad, I remember, I always remember chatting to him, like you'd see him at the BRDC or you'd see him, and I didn't obviously know him well, but only when he passed away did I think, thank God he saw you yeah. do what you did, right? Because he was there to... To, yeah, to, to, is all a part of it. Yeah, he, he well the whole way through. You know, he bought me my first car. Yeah, yeah. Um, and was there through all the good times, the bad times, the ugly yeah. times. Um, yeah. And he, the great thing about my dad was he wasn't a pushy dad. You know, I, I remember oh. the karting days when you see fathers being aggressive um, towards their sons, and it's like, what the hell is going on here? Yeah, but yeah. he was wonderful. You know, he. He let me race. He gave me the opportunity to race. Yeah. Uh, he didn't push me, and he and he said to me through the difficult times, like, you know, if you want to take a break or not race anymore, just just tell me, you know. And, wow. And uh, and that made me want to race. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And made me want to be to be better. Um, and then obviously the dream came true when I got into F1. Yeah. And uh, so Frank told me uh, when I was 19 that I was going to be a Formula One driver, race driver. 
and the first person I saw when I walked out was my dad yeah, so yeah. very emotional lots of tears um, and through the ups and downs in my F1 career he was, he was always there and the great thing also that he, he was in the background he wouldn't have an opinion on things until I asked him yeah um, you know, there were always there, there were times, and I think for, for all of us, if our parents are around a lot, there are certain things that annoy you a little bit. Of course, because they're there. Aren't yeah. They? yeah, and and I sometimes used to be like, oh, he's you know he's having he's having too much fun. We're here to work, and, yeah, yeah. and, and I think to myself, well, no, he's not here working. He's here yeah. enjoying the spoils he's done of his yeah, part. exactly. He's done his bit. Yeah, but it still annoys me at times, and and that's the one thing that I still regret that yeah. I've got annoyed by silly things. But I think that's when you're that close to someone, it, it happens. Because um, he was good. He was quite omnipresent in the bar, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. <laughs> he yeah, was, he was quite well known. And, and I, I always used to tell. I said, Dad, you need to be careful because he had diabetes. He, he, his balance wasn't I didn't great. Know that. I didn't so know. when he, if he had a few drinks, his balance would go and he'd <laughs> fall over. I mean, but so many times I would be with him in a bar and we'd have a table full of drinks and he'd fall over. <laughs> and like the drinks would go everywhere yeah. and you'd get up and I'd be like oh my god oh my god he's gonna be cut everywhere stitches he didn't have a scratch on him and I don't know how that happened um, but yeah I mean he he loved the sport there were he there did. were two people that people always used to say that, that everybody loved in the sport one was Murray Walker yeah and one was my dad and it's true you know the, the messages and the outpouring of love for him when he passed away from yeah. drivers was uh, was insane and, and maybe uh, a lot of drivers wish they had had that relationship with their yeah, dad because because you say he wasn't pushy he did yeah. his thing and they saw him enjoy him himself yeah. you know it's like oh he's loving it he's living the life and he and he definitely was he lived in South France did he um, looking out over Cap Di Bay so he, and he had a, a five fifty Ferrari which he loved in Burgundy That's which bad. he had the sports exhaust Do on you still it. have it yeah That's I good. drove it for the first time in seven years I what drove. a car though right amazing car dad's got one really yeah I love it get to put new tyres on it yeah <laughs> because yeah. he hasn't driven it no, for a while really. yeah, yeah. I drove it to Goodwood um, yeah. Revival last year yeah and it had old tyres on it and it was wet at one point and lethal is, is it really yeah, yeah. but it had all his old CDs and the old CD changer yeah, had Lady so. Gaga oh, and really? yeah, yeah, it, was, yeah. It, was pretty, it was pretty cool so very emotional but amazing memories um, yeah so yeah, you know he was he was always there for me, and to win the world championship with him at the race, um, you know I got out of the car, I saw my physio, gave him a hug. who was yeah. basically one of my best friends at the time, and uh, and then see my dad in his pink shirt was uh, yeah. yeah pretty awesome. Yeah. He, uh, I I mean I guess I feel so lucky my dad's still around. Yeah, you know I mean I really do. It's also as we get as you get older. And he was the first one of these I did with, and we got to like do part two and three because we only just really in an hour, so we like touched on a few things. But I was able to ask, ask him some quite relevant things. Like we never discussed why, you know, like he never really helped me. He helped me, but didn't. He was racing, so yeah. he was like focusing on that. And then he, you know, I'd never really looked at life from his perspective, and I think that's one of the nice things about getting older. Yeah. And probably you now, you got kids. You're probably like, God damn, Dad! I wish I could talk to you about this. Oh yeah, right. Oh, definitely. And you know, I guess with your daddy, you know, you have to be so selfish when it comes to racing. Yeah. You have to. You know, you can't think about other things. You know, yeah. because there's other drivers that are just fully focused on racing. Yeah. yeah. And that's been a big thing for me in life is is not being so selfish. It's mm. tough, and you know, my missus, we have two wonderful kids, but you know, her whole life was she was modeling and doing other things, yeah. but she, again, she was so selfish in what she did, so now we've got two kids. The first year or so, yeah. it's, it's, it's life-changing in the way that you are changing who you are as a person, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in a way, because you don't want to be that selfish person anymore. And the time consumption yeah. is something they don't write about, right? No, and the stress. Like, oh and, my God, And yeah. you also haven't got to, it's like when pe I, some friends are like, oh, we're, getting, we're pregnant, we're gonna have a baby, and I'm like, fuck, you have no idea. <laughs> you buy all those stupid books, everyone gives you these books, and yeah. they're all stacked up by the bed, and they, do, yeah. they mean nothing. Yeah. The one thing that someone said to me, and your kids are still young enough, but you know, they get seven or eight. And then, you know, a friend of mine said, you, they're gonna bring out emotions in you that you had no clue. There's moments you actually kind of hate the little shits because they're just yeah. so 
I've never they're your responsibility yeah. and I, I've never felt that this woman said I've never felt like frustration and anger with another yeah. human being because they're my responsibility yeah. you know and then 30 minutes later or 3 seconds later it's you're like, like oh my god no. I can't, or also I can't believe I felt that way or no, it's I know. yeah and, and then also every time I watch something about kids on TV I just bore my eyes out I'm just emotional it's a trigger yeah I'm glad you said that because yeah. I know you're an emotional guy because you always were in interviews and stuff but like I'll sit there watching a show yeah. and I've got literally tears yeah. running down my face and the kids everyone knows to look at me they go dad's at it again yeah. but the minute I had kids it if it's animals or kids in a movie or a TV show I'm a wreck yeah I mean I watched this documentary yesterday or a couple of documentaries about kids I don't know why my wife put it on but one was about this this boy that he used to do the trampoline um, he was a teenager and he hit his head well, and got brain damage and had yeah. to have operations and stuff and it's his journey his journey back to trying to live a normal life and just the whole time bawling my eyes out <laughs> and he obviously never is going to live a normal yeah. life again but that was one and the other one was a, a lady that or a family that um, they adopted two kids with Down syndrome and I just the, the trials and tribulations and the emotion that she goes through and again I was bawling my eyes yeah, out the whole time <laughs> and the, the youngest girl she can't speak either and she ends up her name's Levy yeah. she's quite famous now she's an artist yeah. and she's a teenager and her art sells for thousands of dollars and she's found her way but the emotion the, 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 the amount of time and effort that goes into that and you kind of think my god my kids are easy yeah I know but they're still not you easy but you touch wood that you yeah, got healthy and, kids right and um you know, the last two weeks of holiday have felt like three years. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're out of preschool, <laughs> but you get you you have so much more time with them, and you see them develop as a as a little kid, and you see, you know, the emotion and the the connection yeah. they have to each other as well, because they're only seventeen months apart. Yeah, wow. And when they play together and they hug, and it's like, oh my god, that's just the best thing in the world. It that's is, better than it? winning an F1 World Championship. Seeing the love they have for each yeah. other. Um, so yeah it's, it's life changing but you still need time for yourself and that's yeah. so important you know my wife now she does interior design architecture design um, and she's amazing at I it I saw something you posted the other yeah, day about so she's, yeah. she's done we've done three houses now together and she's also done another client's house well as in like you bought them and done them up and traded them or? yeah two um, one of them we sold okay. in Palm Springs okay. we've done another house which is almost finished in Palm okay. Springs she's doing our house which should be finished next month she's also done a client's house that's great which is actually in the, in the motor, motoring world which I probably shouldn't yeah. mention names but I'll mention yeah. to you after but it's his son's house that she did and wow. it's, it's not through me at all and I, she's like so I'm doing so and so's son's house I'm like what yes yeah, um, and so that was mad and, and uh, so no she's, she's loving it and again it's great for her because she, yeah. she loves being a mum but she feels that she wants to do something else uh, I don't know how my mum did it you know all, all of our mums you know so many kids my mum had four kids she didn't really have any help no uh, so she was just a mum and that's the hardest job in the world yeah. right it's like four jobs in one yeah, yeah. But, you know, I think a lot of women and uh, now want to go and have a job outside of being a mum as well. And something for themselves. I think that's so important. I think you come yeah. back and you're a great mum for yeah. it. And the same and for I, me. Yeah. I need to go and do my motor racing. I need to have a job like Radford to come, go away, do it, come home. I think I'm a better Be dad better. for it. I think anyone, if you don't have that distraction, you'd, if you'd, you don't. You don't it keeps an idle mind, and I think that's when they turn their attention on us. Yeah, there's a couple you turn each other on each other. So no, you need exactly. That, right? yeah. You need it. Um, and it took a while for us to figure yeah. it out, though. And oh, we and went I, through some difficult times, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And now when we're with the kids, we're more focused on the kids, and we're you know yeah. the time that we have with them is less, but it's much more. There's much more of a connection there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as we're winding it up a bit, but um. When you, I've actually asked this to everybody. It's kind of an interesting question, like with Mario or Jackie Stewart, because you have to have this incredible confidence to do what we did, right? And to do what you did at the level you did, especially. But there's these very human moments, which that's what I think I enjoyed doing the TV. But equally, as we said at the beginning, there was moments I couldn't get involved. Yeah. I'd send Andrew Marriott in. You know what I mean? Like he's a terrier, journalist. <laughs> you know what I mean? If someone like Alan Simonson got killed, I couldn't mm. go. I couldn't go and see Dave Richards and the team. I said, I'm not fucking doing it because no. I can't. It's not a chance. You You're need not. a real pure journalist to go in and yeah. do that. Um, but when you sat in the driver's briefings and you sat there 
and you know we're in our own thoughts right and you 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 know you've got the race you know how your weekend's unfolding and you look around the room and there's just lots of other young guys it's a very private moment an intimate moment everyone's got their own thoughts in their head but who did you look at and go fucking hell if they're on form today this is or was it just a whole load of them you know who was <laughs> but you know who was who oh, was the, the guy is... that you were like because you were raced in an era and the uh, amazing yeah. drivers oh well, i had mika hacken and yeah michael schumacher yeah, it was a pretty through, big list through to fernando alonso yeah. seb vettel lewis yeah. hamilton yeah you know so it, yeah I, when you're racing for 17 years in the sport they come and go um yeah. Uh, so yeah there were lots of very talented drivers and but moments when you're with them that you know on that day you got the car you know qualifying was you know you know you've yeah. got you've got it right I and always it's a looked, dynamic for me it was always it was always an in team battle yeah. because you know if someone had a better car than you to beat them was always tricky but when you had a Fernando Alonso or a Lewis Hamilton that was that was the thing you look at them in the driver's brief and you think if he gets what he can out the car this weekend is going to be very tough to beat. Yeah. How can I be? And how can I work work it in my favour? And that was the biggest challenge for me. It was that inter team battle, and I I loved it. You know, when I had a teammate that was easier, it was like, oh, this is great, and I had more confidence to go racing. But yeah. you didn't have that battle within the team, yeah, and I yeah, loved that battle. Yeah. Did you? It was tough. There were times where I thought, I don't want a teammate as good as Lewis Hamilton. But then most of the time it was that exciting challenge because when you did beat him, it meant so much more yeah, yeah. within the team. So for me, it was that inter-team battle, that rivalry that, that I loved. I really did against someone yeah, as great as him yeah. or, or Fernando. And when I went up against Fernando, it was a very different point in my career than with Lewis. Because with Fernando, we were in a team that was a great team, but with a car that wasn't so competitive. So you're always trying to get one over on him. Yeah. You yeah. know, if you finished 15th or 13th, it didn't really matter. So if you made the car better, great. But it was more about kicking your teammates' yeah, yeah. ass. Because so. it is, right? Because obviously we watch the TV, the fans are watching the TV, and they go, oh, good, he was 9th, or he was 15th, or he was 14th. But if your teammate's 16th, and you're 15, you've, you've won your own yeah, race, right? totally. And yeah. in your head, maybe it doesn't get publicized, but in your head, you've got one over on him. You've got mm. confidence. It's yeah, in your pocket. Yeah, yeah. And that means a lot moving forward. Even 16th, 17th year of my career, it, it meant yeah. a lot. So, yeah, and uh, that for me was key, getting one over on Fernando. And I would sit in the driver's briefing with the engineers and just be looking at him and I'm like I wonder how much he's actually giving away today yeah, yeah, how much exactly. information of how the car felt he's actually telling the truth while I'm yeah, in the room yeah, yeah and it did get like that yeah you know yeah. and I, I did question it a lot and also the way people drove on circuit and testing and in qualifying yeah, and yeah, yeah. did he just lock up there and run wide on purpose because he's in front of me and his lap yeah, wasn't yeah. going well and yeah, he's destroyed yeah. mine and I know things like that and it does play on your mind quite a bit. Yeah. You know, I think Fernando was like that as a driver. Lewis, 100% not. Just on The it. most straightforward driver really? I've ever had as a teammate. Yeah. I like that. Um, but you kind of, when you have it, and I think that's why he struggled a little bit up against Max. Because he's, he doesn't get down and dirty with it when he needs to. Yeah. yeah and I yeah. think that's it shocked him a little bit in 2021 yeah. with yeah. Max. Um, he doesn't have that, but you need that. Yeah. and I think Fernando definitely had that and I, and I really like those fights against yeah, Fernando the danger side it's just part of it it yeah. is and I think when you're young you don't think about it no. you get a bit older you do when you decide to retire you definitely think about yeah. it I remember Brazil 2016 you know I decided halfway through the year I'm retiring I told the team a couple of months later and I got to Brazil, which is one of the last races, and it was torrential rain. I remember. But I, I used to love those conditions, yeah. and I could find the grip and what have you, and I just trundled around at the back, um, and I was just scared. I remember thinking- You'd allowed it into yeah. your psyche. I was like, I don't want to go and have a big accident now, as my career is yeah. almost over in F1. Yeah, yeah. And I, I couldn't get a tire temperature because I wasn't brave enough to push the car. Yeah. And I remember Fernando Alonso, my teammate, being two seconds quick, and I was like, what? And yeah. it's all down to just not getting tire temperature, yeah, yeah, but being brave yeah, enough yeah, to yeah, get yeah. tire temperature. And he overtook me, pulled away, spun off, dropped behind me, caught me, overtook me, pulled away, and it's like, this is just my worst nightmare. <laughs> uh, I just want it to end. 
yeah and then luckily it, it did end um yeah. but um it's funny when you decide to switch off and you know your career's over in that sport that it gets scary it really does yeah. um but then I jump in an LMP car and go and drive it flat out yeah. and two weeks before that car flipped in yeah. Spa so <laughs> you know yeah. in the moment most of the time when you're in the car with a crash helmet on you don't think about it you and it just surprised actually you shouldn't think about it no and that's what happened in Brazil I did and it's like the first time I've ever thought about it and I drove like shit yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's, that's for me the, the reason why I never went to Indy you know, I could, I, I, could never, I could never jump into an Indy car at, at an oval because I knew I would drive it as hard as I could, like everyone does. Yeah, yeah. Those guys are brave, and I think you do need to take your brain out a little bit and put it yeah. to one side. Um, you know, it's a rough race. Yeah, it is. And you know, I raced. I watch, still watch a video when I was nine years old racing at Clay Pigeon. Um, I was nine years old and I was racing against Justin Wilson, Anthony Davidson. Yeah. And Dan Weldon, there's a fight between all four of us fighting for the win. And, you know, two of those guys aren't with us anymore. They both died in IndyCar. So <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's tough when you look at that. Um, I remember when I crashed, I crashed in 2003 in Monaco, my biggest crash in F1. Knocked out, taken to the hospital, wasn't allowed to drive. That like, same weekend, it was Indy 500. And I think it was the 24 hours of Le Mans <coughs> that weekend. And... Dan crashed in, in Indy. He was fine that time. Um, <coughs> and Anthony Davidson crashed it at Le Mans. I was like, oh my God, all three of us. We grew up together as kids and we've yeah. all just had the biggest shunts ever. And it obviously got even worse for Dan. So yeah, it's um, it's a tough thing for me to watch even Indy, I really. Um, as I mean, it is I for watch, a lot of I watch like, you know, when Jill was driving or Elio, good friends, and you, and, you, and Scott Dixon, and you go, I mean, the, when they're the risks they take Scott the, for me is the one that he's probably the he's, I just I, it's wrong for me to say right now because he's racing Indy again but when he had his big accident a couple of years ago at Indy and you saw his head almost hit yeah, the barrier yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like I don't know why he's still doing it but, but he is he is a specimen right I mean yeah. he is really one of the best I mean he could have been great in Formula 1 I'm sure yeah. without any doubt right but he's hell of a and hell of a driver at his age yeah. keeping fit he also enjoys life he gets on he it, does. right? Yeah, and and yet he's he can run rings around a lot yeah. of young kids. Oh, yeah, definitely. Must be a moment you go, fuck it, I'm done. Well, I look forward to the time if it happens that Scott is racing in endurance. Yeah, wouldn't it and be? Hopefully, fun? we can race against each yeah. other because we've only raced against each other once, and that was the revival last year. Uh, okay, you know, I I, I love the revival. I you know, I, I never did it when I was in F one. I don't know why. I probably wasn't allowed to, but. Um, I did it two years ago, 2021, first time. Yeah. Loved it, raced a Cobra um, and an E-Type. And then last year went back and raced two E-Types. And, yeah. um, and it was great to see, obviously, the Frank Kitties there, to see Dixon it's there, amazing. Jimmy Johnson yeah, there. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, you know, it's nice to see so many people from different yeah. different types of motor racing coming to race at Goodwood. Yeah, Goodwood. And in an old everyone's going around the E-Types. Yeah. I was supposed to go and drive Greg at Fiskin's um, a galaxy or whatever, yeah. that, but I couldn't do it. And and he's also it's also like this is the winning car. Oh fuck! I yeah, I know. There's, there's, there's the pressure. There's yeah. a, all right, everyone, going Tom front. Christianson won in it, and yeah. then so and so won it. You're like you know, Emmanuel Piro, and you're like, oh really? Yeah. Oh maybe I'll be permanently indisposed. Yeah. I don't know. But then I jumped in Adrian Newey's yeah. E type, and I was yeah. like, well, you're going to win by a mile. So yeah. Yeah, okay, well, you had to. Yeah, and well, we broke down, but we were quick. Um, but uh, it was so nice seeing them there, and I had a wheel to wheel fight with Scott. Yeah. Um, in the pre 63 category, both in E types. So we're just floating around, yeah, wheel yeah. on the grass, and yeah, yeah. you know, you're still giving it your yeah. all. But I remember I did it the first year, and I went back the second year, and I drove out in the E type, and I was second in the car in practice, and uh, drove out, did like three corners wave someone past an, an amateur car owner and he's going through completely sideways with a wheel off the ground I'm like I don't what? know I can do that I don't know if I can do this I know I and really, then you get in the car yeah and, and, then, and then a few laps later you get into it and it's like oh yeah, there you go yeah. there it is but it just it's nuts yeah, they are really good I remember watching videos of like Sterling and everyone and you go how were they so because our generation just didn't there was once grit came in no one does that no and then you're watching Goodwood and you're like I don't know if I want to do this and like Anthony Davidson is t you know Anthony Reid you know total nut job yes the biggest nut job I've ever yeah. driven I love you Anthony but you Same. are deranged <laughs> when you see a guy at the Goodwood Hill Club Good, yeah I mean 
he only has one speed um but yeah, sideways and everything. Yeah. And then when you do it, you realize those old tires, that's what they do. They gra- and yeah, they the gradual. Moves and they just slide and yeah. it's inside. I really... But last year, they've, they've come a long way, the cars. Yeah, that's the scary yeah. thing. You know, I'm doing 155 miles an hour in Adrian Newey's E-Type on the limiter down the back straight. Thinking, this is quick. Yeah, yeah. These these things don't stop. Like and by like the way, when they hit something, they're still a 1950s car. No, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. Um, and I drove a car last year in the pre-63 which is a um, guy called Bob Neville who runs our yeah. GT team RJN and um, I jumped in his car and he's, he, I drove it the year before I was like, he's like 80 kilos lighter this year I was like oh, oh 80 great. kilos and I get in and I'm sat in and I'm like feels different in here yeah. and I look around he's taking the roll cage out I'm like you've taken the roll cage out of the car he went well yeah because you've got the roll bar behind you uh, and it's a tub, isn't it? You're in an E-type. It's a hard top. I was like, yeah, but it's a, it's a, it's a tub from 1960. <laughs> exactly. A roll cage would have been nice. <laughs> yeah. And I still raced it. Did he? Yeah. That's the stupid yeah. thing, you know. So now I've decided that I'm only going to race a car that's got a full roll cage. Yeah. I'm not going to get in anything even yeah. that hasn't got a full roll cage. But I had that chat with Dad. Dad got asked to drive a 917 that, uh, and it was built by. Um, uh, Norbert, Norbert saying a Porsche he'd been involved so it was as good as it got right? Dad sees it turn up and it's in the I think it was the Peter Wolf colours and Peter Wolf died in that car right? oh Le Mans God. Dad remembers that car being shit Dad drives it and it's still scary he calls Vic Elford and says and Vic said that chassis was all sideways there's something wrong something inherently in that car and Dad calls me and he goes I've got to do the Le Mans historic and I said Dad I don't think you should if you feel like this, yeah. you, why would you do it? You've if walked you through the it, woods, yeah. you've come out the other side, you have a great life, you're fit and healthy, you will still die in that car if it hits the wall at 200 yeah. miles an hour because you're going to go full throttle on the mulls on straight. Yeah. There's no way you're not. And uh, I think that's the fine line in yeah. all that stuff. Don't understand it before you get in it. Yeah. Because as soon as you get in it, you're done. You just go. Exactly. I know, I know. Um, so next year, I've, yeah, and I'm also, I'm building my, uh, I've got a C-Type. Have you? Uh, Fangio's C type. No. This bronze way. one. Yeah, it was his road car. No way. So I'm That's bu- in Europe. Yeah. So okay. I'm building that up, just uh, getting the, got the engine out. Wow. So when did you get that? A few little tweaks to that. I'm and, sure. Uh, and I'll be racing racing that. But again, that, that does a one minute thirty round there, which is which is like the pre sixty three E type yeah. times. Freaking quick. Yeah, and you're hitting hundred and thirty eight yeah. on the back yeah, straight. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> in a before, before we go Kimi Raikkonen, you saw it just as a so I, I've, I've met him once, and I always and I think like everyone, you go just supremely fast, doesn't give a shit about anything else. That's the way it looks yeah. on the outside, but just you know flies around his jet, has a party. Even he's a good, he just seems to have the spirit for me of someone of the fifties yeah. and sixties. He was born in the wrong era. He yeah. was right. Yeah, um, but he's he's kind of cold when you see him in person. He's he's for most people that don't know him, they're like. Oh, he's a bit rude, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. But he's just there for one thing, and that's to go racing. That's it. Yeah, and then when he leaves, he has a good time. And, yeah. you know, I've seen him at many parties over the years, yeah. and if he's got a glass of vodka in his hand, he's relaxed. And, yeah, then, yeah. and then he speaks the truth, and it comes out, and it's great to see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I've, I've had a few parties with him over the years, and uh, a few coming togethers with him as well, yeah. on track no, and off track, with different, different things. But... Um, I remember one that was quite funny, uh, partying in, uh, in, in London, and I don't remember Kimmy being at the club, but he <laughs> obviously was, because I get in a cab, I go home, he's just sat in my kitchen. What? He sat in my kitchen when I get home. First I'm like, I don't know how he got in, <laughs> but he sat there in my kitchen, in Powys Mews in London. And uh, and I walk in. He's just there. He's like, he's hey, JP. He's like, what the hell? Um, and so it could carry on yeah, from yeah. there. But that was the most random moment I with Kimi Räikkönen. And everyone's got a random Everyone moment. Everyone has, right? Yeah. But um, no, he he's an unbelievable talent. And yeah. uh, I remember in his early days. Initially, I was upset when he when he got an F1 drive, and yeah. the reason was because I was. Uh, managed by Dave Robertson, Robertson yeah. yeah. Who's, who's Steve? The, Steve's dad, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Did you race against yeah. Steve? Yeah. yeah, he was my era totally. No way. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was a bit of a yeah, bit of an was, animal as well, yeah, he wasn't was, he? Yeah, yeah. But um, 
the agreement that I had with Dave was that he wouldn't manage another driver. That wasn't my words either in the contract, yeah. it was his. And yeah. then suddenly Kimmy comes along and he's his, he's, he's in managed it. by yeah, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, right, of course he yeah, is. Yeah, so yeah. Um, it kind of, it's just a bit of taste in, in my mouth. So initially it was a bit of a weird one when Kimmy yeah. came to F1. But then, yeah, racing against Kimmy was awesome. And see what he achieved at McLaren. That was for me the best time. Yeah. His best time in F1 yeah, was totally. at McLaren. He just blew us all away with his. Yeah with his skill and what he could do with a car. Yeah. And um, it was a shame when he went elsewhere. He was quick, but he didn't have, I know he won the world championship with Ferrari, yeah, so but I still felt that he was at his best at McLaren. He shouldn't yeah. have left. Wow. When we talk about all the people and all the danger on track and all this, and then it just seems that the nature of a racing driver is to push it and have risk. And it carries on for the rest of your life. I do think so, because yeah. we, have, we have a connection with risk. Like I say to my son, how do you, and he want, want, wanted to be in the military and an army ranger and everything. And, and I said, that's good because you're going to understand something about life, yeah. which is if you, I think if you've risked physically and mentally, but you've risked your life, you have an un appreciation of life that, yeah. that I think if you, and it's not someone's fault that they just work, stop, you know, have no, a normal life. But I think if, if you've risked life, you, you have a, a appreciation for it. You need and, that buzz. And that's a that is a drug right yeah it is, it is. is totally very addictive and but for me it was a controlled risk so i needed to be in something that i understood and believed in in mm. terms of a car as i found lately we're trying different things like rallycross yeah i'm useless because yeah. it's all about drifting and you're yeah. out of control the whole time yeah, yeah. when you're drifting through a corner um but in f1 it was that risk of finding the limit and then it's snapping you know yeah, that yeah. snap and yeah. you think it, oh shit if I crashed then that was a big one yeah yeah, yeah. but bring it back from there it's yeah. like but I controlled it you yeah, know it's, yeah, it's yeah. that it's that close to the edge but being in control yeah, yeah. Is, is what I love and and that goes for a lot of stuff I guess you know with developing the Radford it's really yeah. exciting because I'm yeah. the first one that's driven it I'm the I'm the you know I'm the test pilot yeah no. I'm the one that drives it for the first time so it's a little scary in ways yeah. Um, but I love that buzz yeah. and, and, and that's the reason why I'm never wanting to st I, I, sorry, I always will want to keep racing yeah in one, th one yeah. form and I'm 42 and it scares me a little bit that I'm 42 because I, I worry about how people look at a 42 year old racing driver even though I've won a world championship yeah I worry that in the end they're going to go, oh, I think he's too old. And that, scare, that scares me. That's probably the thing that scares me most Whoa. of life. Okay. Because I want to race yeah. forever. Uh, and at some point I won't be able to race competitively. But then I look at Richard Westbrook, who I knew from my karting days. He just got a huge drive for this year, right? He's back in it. Exactly. You know? He's 48, Yeah, he's I think. Um, and I remember watching him karting. He yeah. always had this weird helmet with this bubble yeah. visor he used to race with in go-karting. But... Uh, He's so a funny boy. That's great to see someone. He's a lovely guy. Yeah. I've known him for many yeah. years. He's very good friends with Richard Williams, one of my best friends. Um, uh, so to see that's great. Yeah, to see Fernando yeah. Alonso kicking ass in F1 and still being, for me, one of the top four drivers on the grid. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that definitely helps the rest of us racing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bill. Bill Oberlin. I was just about to bring him up. Winning his BMW driving <laughs> history. And every time he gets in the car, yeah. it's full commitment. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no concessions, right? Which, which is great, and yeah. uh, that helps us all. But you know, for me, the worst bit for me is that I've, I've taken a couple of years out of the sport, really professional racing. I've been doing karting, I've done some off-roading here and there. I did a GT race in the British yeah. GT, but I've not taken anything too seriously, which has annoyed me, because you can have a couple of years out and then you lose where everything is, and yeah. uh, in terms of people think you don't want to go racing anymore. Yeah. Uh, and to be fair with like the Le Mans thing. You know, I, I should have jumped on it much earlier, yeah, yeah. At the idea of going to Le Mans in the future, but you know, better late than never. But, and and there's a phase, there's phases, it's all yeah. gonna be okay. Yeah, yeah. so no, I, I have a few things that I'm interested in racing in, and I have the opportunity, which is which is really exciting, yeah. and I'll be a better, I'll be a better husband for it, yeah. definitely, and a better dad for it. And I also want my kids to see me race. I know. I don't want them to go, oh, my, I hear my dad was a racing driver yeah. once and see pictures. Well, yeah, you you had kids 12 years late. Well, no, actually, I was 37. But my kids came to Daytona, but they didn't see me. They saw me. I got pictures of them on the grid with me, but it, yeah. it wasn't the same. They're not going to so, remember no, it. No, so I almost young. did, dad and I raced the historic uh 
Daytona 24 hours doesn't mean anything, but we were in the winningest Lowe and Brow 962. When was that? Two years ago. Nice. Winning it, or three years ago. Winningest Lowe and Porsche ever, actually. But to do it with my dad, yeah. it was still 210 or something on the bank. It was just so cool to do it with him. And the kids didn't come to that one because I was like, oh, you know, they were at school. But I almost tried to get in a drive for Daytona because I all my friends are doing it and they're these super rich guys, but they're in their mid fifties to late fifties. I'm yeah, like, yeah. well, fuck, I can still go and do it. So are you Just, a bronze? I'm now a bron- uh, bronze, yeah. That's great. Yeah, because uh, when I hit 50, I was I was gold and still, I might be a silver actually. You can't be. I can't be silver, I've got to be a bronze now. Yeah, yeah you've got, got to be a bronze. bronze, yeah. You should be a bronze, yeah. and then you get loads of drives. No, so you can I get know. paid to drive I now. Know. <laughs> I might get back into it, because it also gives you a reason to, to focus and stuff. Um, yeah. The reason I also brought up about the risk is how many of us have perished after yeah. racing and like Ken Block this week and uh, uh, lots of other people I know, but that was shocking. Yeah. Monday morning or whatever, he was he was having breakfast with friends and having a great time. By lunchtime, he was yeah. gone. It's funny because that one shocked me more than most because racing drivers pass away, whether yeah. it's from incidents, silly incidents, doing something else. Yeah. Or, uh, or old age, right? Yeah. Um, or sickness. But um, that one really sh- shook me. I remember I was sat on the couch with my wife and it just took my breath away. Um, yeah. One, because I had been texting with him probably six weeks, two months before. Mm. He had his event in LA. Mm-hmm. I think it was it here? I'm not sure if it was here at the Peterson or if it was. Mm at the bike shed I'm not sure but with the Huna Pig I can't remember what it's called yeah. Huna the Pegasus or whatever yeah, it is yeah. um, and then I saw the car a couple of weeks ago at BBI the yeah. people that put it together because um, we're doing something which is kind of similar but anyway so I saw the car and it's just it, it just blew me away because the guy is he's done so many extreme things whether it's on tarmac on dirt jumps stunts pushing the boundaries up Pike's Peak. Yeah. And then he, he you know, he, he dies on a, on a snowmobile and I, you kind of start thinking stupidly that he's invincible. You know, he's so skilled that he can take anything yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's not like he didn't know what he was doing on, no. a, on a snowmobile. Yeah. You know, he spent the winters in um, Can-Ams or snowboarding on, on snowmobiles and, uh, it can just take you like that just yeah. just the wrong position the, the snowmobile from what I heard landed on him I'm guessing just at the wrong angle and he's gone um, you know he posted that day know. about you know the the, the resort uh, of where he was and, and how good the snow was and about his daughter that's just built this amazing yeah. quattro and for that family I mean for anyone that loses someone early at that age it's unbelievably tough but they they lived his life it wasn't that he went away and did motor racing and stunts and stuff and came home to the family they all lived that life yeah. they all rallied together they all raced they all raced rally together yeah. the wife the daughter uh so yeah really tough and um the outpouring of love for him you just Amazing. see how many people he touched and yeah. motor racing world and even people that aren't in the motor racing world you know people that watch this culture really it's yeah exactly pop culture, but it was it was he, the, he yeah. was part of that cultural he created revolution he created culture. it yeah. yeah he did you know he had obviously dc shoes um yeah. and and with the, the youtube videos he probably got more people into seeing cars that we love than, yeah. than anyone else you know yeah. bringing people into motorsport so and he was a lovely guy with it yeah. you know um he did it because he loved it you know yeah. i'm sure he spent a lot of money on motor racing yeah. he wasn't he would have been paid by sponsors but he still i'm guessing put his own yeah. money into it because he loved it so much yeah. so yeah. yeah really tough one for the motorsport world it's been a tough year considering we're still at the start of january oh, um, a guy called robbie pierce who in the off-roading world was massive um yeah. and uh he offered me jimco basically he offered me to drive one of his trucks at in the min 400 once I didn't take him up on the offer I should have but uh, I didn't and uh, and he passed away scuba diving um, and his his biggest passion so yeah you know it feels that people in the motorsport world we're all trying to push our boundaries yeah. and push the limits and find that buzz but I think 
for me it just shows how you just got to enjoy every day yeah, and, and Ken definitely did that uh, yeah. um, he definitely did that and you know he'd have been wide open at the moment of oh yeah he's all turning to yeah. this world to the next uh, which is probably the way to be it is and I'm sure it still hurts like hell oh. for the family you know you sell it to the family they're gonna go yeah but still it hurts like yeah. hell because we've lost our dad but they understand the person he was and yeah. uh, and he was a big family guy as well and I think that's the the um the feeling that everyone that knew him well yeah. i didn't him that well is that his racing was one thing but you look at him and how he included his family and everything they were such Quite a inspirational. such a close family close-knit family yeah so the last thing i kind of ask everyone before we go and it's different when you're talking to mario andretti or jackie stewart because they've got 80 years reflecting and they you know the runway is very short in front but you're like right in the middle um have you got a changing philosophy for life do you think because it's like as you say live every day you see what happened to ken and robbie you 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 you, know, you want to live life the best you can um do you have a particular philosophy on life i mean if i was a young cartoon kid and i was like jensen how am i going to be great but, you know what's what's your sort of feelings about how you should conduct your life don't take yourself too seriously <laughs> that's the yeah. main thing i think as racing drivers we do you know we got to be very serious when it comes to motorsport and uh you know as you said about the dangers involved but i think as people as human beings these days we take ourselves way too seriously yeah um i think we need to be more of an open book i think we're all very um as myself i was very insecure growing up mm. even in formula one very insecure as most mm. racing drivers are yeah uh, I think we've got to be more open with our feelings. Um, Lando Norris was great. Last year he came out and said, I've struggled with insecurities, uh, mental health. Yeah. I think being as more open with, with who we are and with our feelings is key. I think it's really important. I think as a racing driver, you think of it as a weakness. I think I don't want to be open with my feelings or tell people that I'm finding something yeah. tough uh, or mentally in a bad place you think of it as a weakness you think people are going to use it against me but i don't think i don't think they do i think it's it's the it's the right time to be open with your feelings yeah, yeah. um get out on track and give it your all but when you're feeling down ask for help yeah. there are so many people that are there to help you whether it's your yeah. dad your mum, your best buddy who i'm sure take the piss out of you initially but then he'll be there to help you yeah, yeah yeah and you know that's 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 really important and uh a lot of us just hold everything inside and it and it doesn't help i went through a moment in my cartoon career where i was 13 years old you know kind of like girls suddenly it's like yeah. oh suddenly she's gone from that annoying girl in the playground to suddenly she's 13 14 yeah. i kind of think yeah. she's cute yeah but and i was racing at the time and, yeah. and so much going on inside my head inside my body yeah. and and i didn't know how to take it all and that's when my racing career was a career at 13 just went to the floor really and, yeah. and, uh, and, I, and I didn't ask for help and I remember I was on the way home with my father from a kart race in Scotland and my stepmom was in the car with us and I was asleep behind in the van, the transit van and he thought I was asleep and he said to her I, I just don't think he's got it and that hit home Ooh, and that was yeah. like oh shit you know I need to really focus on, on being better and also I don't want to disappoint my dad and I never, I didn't tell him that I was awake and I heard that until I won, won the world championship. Did you? And I got out of the car and I, I hugged him after the race. He was crying his eyes out. I didn't tell him then. Did the interviews, saw the team, celebrated, and then I pulled him to one side and I told him. And uh, it gets me emotional every time yeah. I, I, I talk about it. But uh, obviously he cried his eyes out. and I, I kind of felt bad telling him, but it, um, he just looked at me and shook his head. And, said see it, it worked, worked. <laughs> it worked <laughs> oh, um, but I think I think in anything you do um, you're going to find some some of it is going to be fun some of it is going to be great and you're going to succeed but a lot of it is going to be tough 80% of my career was bloody hard and mm. tough and I wasn't winning and then 20% of it was amazing um, enjoy those great days but realise that you're going to have bloody tough days yeah uh, but it's about how you conduct yourself in, in, that, in those times that really makes you what you are. Well said. I'm glad we did this, JB. 
Thank you, mate. That was two hours. Two hours, Christ. Two hours, JB. <laughs> JB, JB. As I, as I said to someone, uh, when I said to Jill, I said, I'm on my way to interview the really successful version of myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't, don't say that. No, no, I'm happy. I am. Good. Thank you for listening to Life of Legends. Hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please share this episode with your friends if you think they'll enjoy it as well. On that note, make sure to head over to lifewithlegends.com and catch up on other episodes as well as see my portraits of these amazing people, all signed by the legends themselves and limited to 24 museum quality prints. Thanks for your support, everybody, and I'll see you next week.